Good morning, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live Show number 307. Oh, I forgot to warn you, Stephanie, we might have people from Marriott watching today, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> we just well, had a call with them. Watch. Yeah, <laughs> we had... Uh, we had a, a call, one of my friends of mine, we're talking with the, uh, I don't know his official title with the Marriott, but it's for food and beverage. Because of the hospitality channel, we're reaching out to a lot of places for content. Like, hey, guys, what do you want to put onto this channel? And we've been having some pretty fun dialogues with um, Marriott's first major brand, but a lot of other organizations like the uh, Colorado uh, Restaurant Association and some other uh, food manufacturers like uh, Altashama and stuff like this, that are saying, wow, you know, we have this TV channel. That's about hospitality. It's not consumer side hospitality. It's industry side hospitality. Uh, and there's there's one. Oh man, I'm, I'm I'm so happy when we get to do this. So the Colorado Restaurant Association is taking some of their culinary students and putting them in an RV and try making them travel around the state for six weeks. And they're showing they're going to uh, livestock places, uh, farm places, and everything else. And they're literally showing video video wise how all this works, like where does it actually come from and how does it get created, uh, but produced and manufactured and uh, uh, processed and things. And then how does that get into a menu plan and how do you make menu plans and how do you put, and the, and the end of the show is basically them putting a plate of food up in the window, which I think is brilliant. It's like everything prior to the moment that it actually goes out to the guest. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think it's going to be pretty cool if we can get that kind of content on the, the channel as well. Uh, and Steph, of course, all your brilliancy should be on there as well. So, you know, just, you know, um, but anyway, with me, sorry, I didn't make introductions yet. Miss Stephanie Smith with, 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 I was going to say Cogwell Marketing, but it is Cogwell Marketing. Um, and her amazing green screen, which is very cool and cheeky. I think it's, you know, what it is, it's a statement of honesty. Instead of making the pseudo background, you're making it the background that is the background of the background. So <laughs> way you're the double entendre. Kind of, hey, Mr. Doug Upman. How Hello. are you? Um, Hi, nice, Stephanie. <laughs> Also with us, Mr. Dean Schmidt with Basecamp Meta, and just recently jumped in, Ms. Adele Gutman with Um, We were talking about universal solutions over, and the fact that Marriott might be watching us today because of the Hospitality Channel and all this other cool stuff. So, um, yes, we all acknowledge that Mr. Robert has been slack daddy again today uh, and did not send out his uh, highly touted and uh, constantly praised uh, list of happy thoughts to it. But... There's been some pretty interesting. So I have a question for Steph, actually, since I have the privilege of being here. One of the active conversations on Clubhouse this week has been the reality of channel mix. Um, we were selling to anybody that wanted to buy, basically. And now we're faced with the fact that whoever bought is showing up. And that is historically not the segments of people that we normally had. So we got a lot of mix of family people coming in when there is some startup corporate travel and there's also the mix of those that don't normally travel with families, but they're all taking advantage of what we were offering prior to now um, different prices. And they're all kind of showing up at the same hotel and the hotel is kind of showing its multifaceted size in ways that they probably didn't anticipate because you know you have people that are trying to enjoy whatever level of service they're used to not having a family. And meanwhile, they're tripping over families. And, and so, I mean, has that been a part of any conversation that you've been of, or is that just a recent growth of people becoming aware of the fact that they're kind of mixing up their segments or what do you think? Yeah, we, I mean, there, during most of the pandemic, we threw channel mix out as a, um, as a metric, cause it was, you know, do whatever you can to get heads and beds for a long time. But we've actually um, started uh, looking at that more, more in terms of, you know, to Dean's point, like if we start seeing in that over dependency on OTAs when the business is really strong, then we certainly want to turn on OTAs. So we have a portfolio account that we're working with um, that we can see the data points for channel mix in, in aggregate on a large scale, uh, which is really cool to see. So most of our hotels, like if they were running really high OTA dependency in January, February, that's steadily coming down. There's a couple markets um, that have been increasing and we're like, what, why are we, why are we increasing our OTA dependency uh, in May and June? So like those have been the ones that we've been focusing on and diving in and seeing like, did they forget to turn their promos off, their OTA promos and things like that. Um, but I've also, now that I've been paying more attention to it in the last few months, I've also been really impressed with overall brand.com contribution. Again, this is a portfolio of branded hotels. But I've still been really impressed with, you know, most OTA, I mean, most brand.com contributions have been, you know, between 35 and 40% from a lot of the major brands, which I've been super pleased with. 
Now, do you think that's kind of in part because of the limitations of what the, the hotels could do for themselves and the fact that brand is reawakening in their efforts and that the, the contribution is there? Or do you think it's a sustained, hey, at least I know what to expect. There's Marriott protocols in place or Hilton protocols in place, IG protocols in place. So I have an expected value proposition to the brand and therefore I'm going to selectively choose from brands that are offering rates. I mean, yeah, it, it, I think that, well, I think it's important to note that most of these hotels are select service, kind of your, um, the more steady eddy brands within the, um, within a lot of the big brands. So I think that, I think, at that point, there's that confidence in the in the brand and stuff. I mean, if you're taking your family somewhere and you're looking for that resort experience or more um, experiential thing, I don't think these are necessarily the hotels for. That's like a totally different reasoning and totally different booking and thought process. I think. I'm 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 going to steal your steady Eddie statement because I have never been able to truly accurately portray um, mid tier uh, limited service properties correctly with some phrase that wasn't diminutive. <laughs> so steady Eddie, <laughs> so steady Eddie is pretty good because I usually say, "Oh, white vanilla on vanilla, vanilla." You know, it's like because it is. It's 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 the expected anticipatory value proposition, consistency of product. It has all the values that make up what a brand is. But you, you, to describe it, it sounds kind of like, oh, it's a function rather than an enjoyment. And there's some crazy, incredible crews that work at these places that are just as dedicated to you having a great experience staying with them as any multi-star or destination-based resort is. You know, that 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 that, that feeling of, of welcoming is just as profound for them. So, you know, I don't mean to be diminutive to it. As a matter of fact, to something that Dean points out, meta search for them is freaking off the hook right now. I mean... I actually had to screen grab yeah. for one of my clients a little wow statement. I screen grabbed in because I was in Cody, you know, yeah. looking at stuff. One of their hotels was 44 to one in the past 30 days. Oh I'm not talking about seven days. I'm talking about 30 days. Wow. <laughs> you know, wow. and another one was 30 something yeah. and another one was 20 something. And these are even on, yeah. even on Priceline travel ads, it's not, you know, that's on the retail side of Priceline. And since there's hardly nobody competing, um, and nobody playing in the space. I mean, we're still talking about calls per clicks that are under 30 cents. So I have yeah. one hotel that's maxing out, you know, 100% impression share on Priceline. Um, again, on the retail wow. side, and we have like 130 to one ROI. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. And it's largely because the CPCs are really low right now, right? And they right. have been. The CPCs are but stupid because nobody's doing it. How are they that's trending good. though? Like, do you see them trending up? The spin is trending up, but it's still not yeah. in enough volume capacity to drive the needle. But if I can pay 30 cents to just be number one oh, all yeah. the time, I'm just every gonna, day. I'm going to do it all. The, all yeah, just, you know, all day. But I think that's why we're interested in booking.com rolling out their own travel ads. Um, you know, it's always I always get caught up like Expedia, like if we're doing accelerator, we're doing promos and travel ads, you know, like how do we determine incrementality? And I think that's going to happen with booking.com. If you're running preferred, maybe even genius, you know, how are you going to determine the incrementality of the CPCs of the revenue from the CPC model? But, um, you know, another tool in the toolbox. I mean, if you, I think a lot of people use that spray and play and leave it on all the time method. And we try to be a little bit more strategic about understanding need dates and running ads against those, but I'm excited to see. Yeah. For one of my hotels, I found the um, Expedia sponsored placements. I don't remember what they called it exactly, but it's where you you get a richer description and a second picture. So in, so you don't show up with the same picture, both on the sponsored listing and on your natural listing. You get two different pictures. So you get to... Um, convey another part of your story uh, that maybe catches somebody's eye better th than if they miss this one, they'll catch this one. But also just the richer description, because if your hotel isn't a brand, or even if it is, but you have some unique uh, amenities to offer, something that distinguishes you from the rest of the crowd, it's so important just instead of just saying, you know, Hotel ABC, it's, uh, you know, we're the closest to this. We offer the amenities like this, this, and this. Things that are really going to capture somebody's attention. And it was, 
I felt crazy cost effective, very, very helpful because we really did have something to say. And otherwise they would have just seen the name and the picture and that was it until they, unless they actually clicked on it. Why would anybody click on it if they don't know anything about you? So that was so helpful. I remember also in the early days when I was advertising um, for the library hotel, just buying the Google for the brand names. And it was a hundred to one. And I was like, I, 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 I hesitated doing it. I said, why do I need, why do I need to advertise when people are already Googling my name? But you know what? I, I cannot, could not argue with the fact that instead of uh, clicking on some OTA, they're coming straight to our website and they're definitely going to have a better uh, opportunity for conversion. Um, so it, it, it was wonderful. But then all of a sudden it became like $3, $4 instead of 30 cents. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that makes a huge difference. There's such an opportunity right now in a lot of these different programs, whether it be in CPCs or in, med in MetaSearch, SEM, and so on, to take advantage of the, the low cost per click, uh, a very high click-through rate, which now you have to be cautious of because that high click-through rate is attractive. I want to get the clicks. That's why I'm there, right? But the more clicks you get, the more it is going to cost, even at 30 cents per click, right? But so your volume increases, but you're getting a really high click-through rate and relatively high conversion rates right now. I'm seeing all of those numbers pair up very nicely to, to like Lauren was saying, to create these obscene returns on investment right now. It's an opportunity to gather that information, get some historic data in place, because guess what? They are not going to stay this way. Those costs per clicks will go up. Yeah. yeah and you know what? It also depends on your availability, because for us, I definitely found that if we were in a place where we you know, we had pretty high occupancy. So room type availability, like if you were looking for a king bed, you know, I might not have had a king bed available. Maybe I had a queen or a full size beds, uh, you know, left at that time or, or, or the rate was, you know, sometimes we charged a hundred dollars or $150 more than the hotel next door. And, you know, so so sometimes that conversion would not be there. Sometimes people were looking for a room with two beds. My hotel doesn't have rooms with two beds. This one example. I mean, some some of the hotels did and some didn't. But the hotels that had a large variety of room types available on any day of the week that you went to to look for, that had a much better chance of converting. So um, I would definitely... You definitely spend more if you can for the days where you have wide availability because you're just burning through clicks if you only have a suite left at $600 a night and yeah. that's not everybody's cup of tea. But you don't know, in search, you don't know what date they're searching for. That's true. That's true. Is there you any way you can... For that day this, or that this, night or for three months? Yeah. you do. <laughs> Is there any way you can target for for what time period they're searching for? I met a search I can. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's actually one of the new the new toys that Google just released uh, within Google Meta Search. Is I can be specific to the time that they are shopping for. That's um, amazing. Yeah, which it creates Game some changer. really unique opportunities with what you can do with it. Now, Meta Search is sensitive to your inventory to begin with. So if the only thing that you did have was a suite that's what they would be putting out there to sell uh, and probably wouldn't sell, right? It's, you know, they're probably not going to book that on MetaSearch for $600 a night. Uh, but what it does allow you to do is to start looking at your need periods. I especially like this when we talk about some of the destination-based programs like Google Promoted Properties or TripAdvisor Sponsored Placements where somebody searches hotels in New York and do I want to come up higher in that ranking order? Well, now if I can look at that and base it upon my need dates and say, hey, you know what, uh, mid-September, uh, we're at really low occupancy. We need to get some more in there. Yeah, that becomes very effective. Now, we do have to remember that that has a different return, right? It, it's a non-branded search term effectively is what that is. It's new business. It's new revenue, but it's not going to return at a, 
hundred thirty to one by any means, right? It is going mm -hmm. to have lower returns. Not even close. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we have to understand what that is, uh, but it can be very useful when used right. Yeah. I, 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 I'm gonna bring up. Go ahead. Go ahead, Steph. Go ahead. I was gonna. I want to. I'm kind of going backwards a little bit on the channel mix. I think the other thing that um, we've been looking a lot more at is understanding your channel mix against your comp set. So if you've mm -hmm. got Calibri or you've got Demand 360, so like we've been using that more to determine if we're going to be running specific ad placements. So for example, you know if the comp set is getting whatever, 8% occupancy from Expedia, and we're already getting 12, then maybe we're already, maybe they're whatever filters people are using. Because the hard thing is if people are searching on Expedia, you don't know what taxonomy they're using. You don't know what breakdown they're using. Necessarily, you don't get any of that data. So you don't know how people are filtering it to get to see where you are and where you don't. So if you're already outperforming the comp set in terms of you know, Expedia, maybe you're, maybe if it ain't broke, don't fix it type mentality. But if you are underperforming, then you're like, okay, maybe we need to if we're, you know, if the comp set's outperforming us in terms of occupancy by 5%, then yeah, we maybe need to put more in travel ads or look at different ways to increase our organic placement. So I think the when we talk about your percentage of total, like direct or total OTA dependency is only matters as it's relative to the comp set. So you're, mm -hmm. maybe your brand.com or your website is producing 30% contribution. But what is that, you know, if you have a bunch of other Marriott's in your comp set, for example, and they're doing 40%, then your 30% doesn't look so good anymore. So right. looking at it, instead of like this freestanding data points, looking at it in aggregate against your comp set, if you have that data available above and beyond what the star yeah. doesn't tell you. I think another thing to think about also is um, what your cancellation percentage is on an OTA because you cannot be uh, thinking that, oh, they booked it and it cost me this much and I'm getting this much revenue because they're probably giving, they're probably when they're reporting to you using the full revenue, which is including probably including the the commission not the net red never re, uh, net revenue and number two you, they're not counting the fact that 30 percent of the people are going to cancel or 50 percent you know it depends on on your situation and your relationship and and how how much you put into um the otas in terms of non-refundable Yep. No, but there's so much on the cancellation. Like if the comp set's dropping their rate at the last minute and people are trade down because they don't have any, you know, <clears throat> any penalties, it's really hard. And for us in the brand ecosphere, it's almost impossible for me to determine cancellation rate, again, as a comparative metric against what your OTA cancellation right. rate is. So it's uh, it's one of those things I've been talking with um, Jennifer over at Calibri about because I would love to be able to have that comparison data point because you're right if you're canceling at 50 percent it i mean i think lauren we've talked about that like incorporating that into your your roas discussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. determine the actual value of what you're doing too and, and to that end i think we've had some uh, perpetual discussions the past couple weeks as well is our marketing um ecosystem right now is definitively different you're talking about your comp set and i'm, I'm kind of smiling because the star reports and things that are being used in, in comp analysis are blunt instruments at this point yeah they're, they're just like, is my ADR at my time frame 28 or seven days in comparison to my chosen comp set better or worse? It's like the, the, the nuances of your indexing and everything else. Yeah, it's just, it's not there. And so you're kind of just fuzzy, you know, through a fuzzy glass looking at your comp set from that perspective only. You really need to, what you're saying, look at what you're actually gaining and garnering from all your segments to, in comparison to them, your channels in comparison to them and see whether or not you're beating or losing in comparison. Uh, also too, and, and it's weird to say is that, I don't know if anybody's taking a hard look at their comp set given the changes that's happened in their market. A lot of times, I, I well, not a lot of times, one time in particular that I can say firsthand is you, it was just whacked and way off. The, the, you know, the two of the hotels were still closed. One of them was a non-comparative uh, box option that doesn't, that, that their market demand for what they were being compared to wasn't there anymore. And so their analysis of their pl their place in market was just totally not, it just wasn't even close to being what it should be. So, you know, yeah. that, that. In Demand360, you can have multiple comp sets. So a lot of our hotels, 
um, we would keep the same, keep this star mat because it's too painful to change the star comp set sometimes. So we'd keep the same comp set in demand mm -hmm. and then add a secondary comp set um, in demand. So you had a little bit more comparable measures, but I agree. And there's yeah. some, some of the hotels on star, like they don't report out their, you know, breakout of like contracting group. So it's like, you know, it's just like, it, I just, I know it's like the golden star and all things. And I know that's what owners look at, but it's super painful for me to try to use that as some type of metric. And I think there's, there's a, there's some agencies out there that'll say, Oh, if you do SEO, you know, you'll see it on your star report. I call bullshit. Yeah, it's true. So, it is. But yes, it, 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 it that, that is not a good You can do all the right things in the world from an SEO standpoint and steal your comp set without performing. If they've got, base business that you don't, or they've got, you know, whatever group or, I mean, there's so many metrics that go into play into the, with that star report. I'm like, that's such a false statement. And, and, and the part that they don't include in their conversation is that you as a brand are always compared to your brand family. So it, it, by introducing your product in front of them as for what you represent as brand also brings in everybody else in that conversation. Should you have uh, rating consistency issues, inventory availability issues, proximity to their event issues, there's lots of things you're literally introducing the very same people that will take the business from you <laughs> on the merit of what brought you in front of them, which is like, I'm a flag property. I, I have this consistency of brand product, whatever. And even to the point Adele, where you make about, you know, re re reviews and so forth, it also leans itself that people are going to say, it's also a brand that I have recourse with. I have points or membership or something. And even though they have a lower score, their rate or their location or their inventory is something that the hotel that I would prefer doesn't have. And they're going to settle for something different, thinking that they still have that that relationship to lean on, kind of thing. So, of course, it, of course. Yeah. I mean, location is still first and foremost, and if it fits your budget, you yeah. Know? But uh, but if all things are equal and you have uh, four corners uh, in an intersection with a hotel on each one, and one is getting five star reviews and you know charging a few dollars more than the one across the street that's getting three and a half or four, they're gonna yeah. go to the four and a half or five. And you're gonna be happy to pay that extra mm -hmm. because you know nobody wants to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. it, it's funny. Any, like conversion case studies, like that says, you know, the hotel was this, now they're here, you know, and like tied that back to any type of revenue. Because I believe it. I believe a a thousand percent because my some two of my hotels are have such bad reviews that I don't I think they're but it's really hard for me to like tell that story until you know what I mean well you know what uh, I can I can tell you that if you watch the hospitality reputation marketing podcast I'm talking to hoteliers who you know some of them who have done that uh like, for example, Christine Trippi, before she be, became a, uh, a, uh, a trainer uh, to the world, she was a general manager at a hotel that had gone into the red zone uh, in terms of guest satisfaction. And she was meant to go in there and clean up. And everyone told her she'd have to fire a lot of people and everything and just obviously the GM left because she replaced them and one person decided to leave and everybody else was just the same people that she had. And they had lost so much business um, during the time that they had bad reviews. And once they buckled down and started working as a team towards getting great reviews and became the number one hotel in their County on TripAdvisor, she said she got every single one of those businesses back that 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 defected to another hotel and their um rev par index was 212. yeah there was actually what a study that, <laughs> there was actually a study that was done by cornell university a couple of years back and i don't have it in front of me so i can't quote the exact numbers but it did spell out a, a very specific number of for each increase in your reputation score equated to an increase in your ADR. Uh, and, it, and it did a nice job of spelling that out. I'd have to Google and I can probably find it and send it to you. But yeah, there is a direct correlation between those. Yeah, I, would, I would say that 
in most cases, you're absolutely right. And in, in normal environment, I also think there's a very much of a hybrid circumstance right now, and maybe in just defined markets or particular markets, that the demand is in such excess to to the market that inventory availability is the pivot point for any decision process. Because there are some ludicrous prices out there right now. Really, are. Uh, just just <laughs> didn't Absolutely. even know the rack rate, that rate was on the back of a door prices. Like really, seriously, that was on the back of your door. Um, for those that, you know, there's a rate that is established by law that gets on the back door. So anyway, of your room. Um, and, and you know, this is this is creating, I think, some secondary wave issues. For me in particular, I'll give you my personal for example of it. I'm actually foregoing the desire to travel right now simply because I'm expecting it to settle down to some normalcy at a later date, price-wise. You know, I'm hearing from friends that are out there traveling now. Uh, amazing, to see, you know, thirteen hundred dollars for a five day car rental kind of stuff, and it's a, it's a little box car. There's there's nothing special except for it's got wheels on it. Um, you know, seven hundred dollar flights between hubs. You know, uh, the Dallas and uh, Atlanta thing, just a straight up hub. And if you wanted to add extra stops, like two, like Chicago and Philadelphia, you're only saving two hundred bucks off of it. It's like for two hundred bucks, I'll stay on the plane. Um, you know, and and then the hotel rooms that are charging. You know, a thousand dollars, and I'm not exaggerating in the one instance of the person who was telling me this. And yet, most of the restaurants uh, are closed, and those that are open are limited service product uh, offerings. A lot of the amenities aren't being offered at all. So, you're paying beyond premium pricing for the ability to stay there. So, Adele, I completely agree with you about you know, high GOPs. Huh? <laughs> Ridiculously high GOPs and flow throughs right now. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's really people are just snarfing off. Then I talked to friends that are. When I was talking to you last night, actually, and they were heading out to Yellowstone. I'm like, oh, dude, that's great. He says, yeah. I said, isn't it going to be busy? He says, oh, it's going to be crazy busy, but it's all just locals because I can't even imagine the demand. Of the, these windows of going to Yellowstone literally opened up because the international market had to, to cancel. So their ability to actually get to Yellowstone Park is in part due to the fact that the limitations of incoming traffic from international travelers. Because I guess at this time, even in the past year, it would not have been available to book because it was already pre-booked for years ahead because of limited inventory that's available in that market. And so uh, he's saying, yeah, I'm going to take full advantage of it, even though it's going to be busy, at least I get to go in a year before I thought I would ever get there. And, and you know, I, I was talking to our clients in Canada, they're going through phase right now. I mean, as of July 1st, there is going to be changes in the travel capacities of what you're allowed or not allowed into the Canadian market for. So there's going to be a change in it. And, and, as Canada gets better at it, its vaccination program than we are, um, bitter pill, uh, they're going to have the uh, ability to travel easier between the U.S. and Canada back. So there is a factor of Canadian travel that can come into some markets because there's a lot of pent-up demand of wanting to enjoy the summer market in the United States from Canada fully vaccinated. And they don't have to go through this incredibly arduous. Um, there's a girl, another Stephanie, actually, Steph, I think you may know her, Stephanie Mayo that's on Clubhouse. She's, yeah, she is in, in Toronto right now. And I told her she needs to write a book about what she had to go through to get there. I mean, yeah. absolutely I mean, astronomical. Tammy some stories too, Tammy, with yeah. sales about how, like she's had the police knock on her door to make sure that they're doing, like that people in the same household are staying in different rooms. Like, and she has an app, so if she leaves and they're like, uh, you've left like more than X amount of feet from your house, like crazy. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's, 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 it, and, and, you know, they, 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 I guess she said the same story. So where she was on the computer doing her virtual verification test. Like, it, I guess she had to be on the camera to show that she's taking the test. And while she's doing it, somebody's knocking at her, her hotel room door, which in her mind, nobody should be visiting her anyway. So she ignored it. The paper slid under the door saying you're in violation of your your uh, quarantine and that you're subject to a fine and police you know intervention. Dozen. So she's like, wait a minute, you know. So this the, some of the stories that she was talking about I, that makes it painfully arduous for that kind of travel. Well, that's changing a little bit. And even in the news recently, BBC we, we watch the news every once in a while. Um, their red zone, yellow zone, gr and green zone strategy alerts as to which countries people can travel to. Uh, they just opened up a bunch of Mediterranean countries now for England to travel to. But the caveat is that they are on the border of green to amber, either you know, they're mid-tone. So you could go to this country as a green and go through the quarantine protocol reduction. But you could also, in the next day, it flipped to an amber, and all of a sudden you're stuck going through quarantine protocol again.
Oh no. It's like it, Damocles is sword over your head for travel. You know, it's like, wow, I could go try to enjoy myself, but at a moment's notice, my whole world changes and I got 14 day quarantine protocols I got to go through, you know, just crazy stuff. So to me, I think from a marketing perspective, two things are happening in my mind. One is marketing is being perceived as a eminent sales perspective. And so people are saying, I don't need to market right now. I got more business than I can logistically handle. Um, and they're not realizing that this is the awareness prop proposition of being able to talk to people in the future tense when they're not as popular. Uh, so that's a kind of a discussion that's going on. And the second is, I think that the competitiveness of marketing isn't existing right now. Uh, hotels aren't so worried about how they're compared to other hotels. They're just worried about whether they got a housekeeper showing up at the time they need them and or front desk and or logistics and functionality is in operationals are they, the mainstay of their, their focus. And they don't really comp sets, whatever. Hey, good luck to them. If they're, you know, if they're having the same level of business we're having, then we're all happy. You know, they're not really worried about competitive marketing. And I think that's not going to probably return possibly just before holiday. I don't know. Do you guys have any prognostications? What you think is going to be the cycle of the summer bubble? Well, not even a bubble. The summer surge and where it abates. Does it abate or does it just surge again for fall and then surge again for holiday? I mean, no. what do you guys think? My concern is that everyone's going to enjoy living high for, you know, two more months. And then it's going to come to a screeching halt when everyone goes back to school because a lot of the companies are getting the, you know, your work from home is stopping after Labor Day. You know, a lot of the, if not longer, but I hear Labor Day is like the new get your butt back into the office kind of date frame. Mm -hmm. So if he doesn't return in the in a wishful capacity, I think we're going to come to a screeching halt in September. I hope I'm wrong. I truly hope I'm wrong. But I, I tend to agree with you, unfortunately. I, I, I also hope you and I as well are both wrong on it because Again, we, we've loved the leisure traveler. That's been fantastic. But what happens when that, as you said, goes back to school, the business travel has not yet right. come up to fill in that void. Yeah. yeah. And I still think, you know, for somebody who's used to working in cities where January and February is the worst, it's going to be worse than the worst, you know, mm -hmm. because there there is – there is always a limitation on the occupancy during those times and to also have the effects of, you know, even we are still having COVID just not, not everywhere in the same way, but it's still, it's still going to be just a fraction of what it was before when it's the low season, when it's the high season and there is, you know, just unconstrained demand. That's a different story. Right. It I think in, in strange ways, it's like, I, I, I agree with you. I think that the, because you see on the news things like the president of Morgan Stanley saying, our team is expected to be in the office by the end of uh, uh, July. And if they're not in that office by the end of July, then we're going to have a whole different conversation. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. In the office it's, and vaccinated, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, and it's just, it's one of these things where it's like, okay, so let me get this right. You were happy with an hour and was it hour and 13 minutes or hour and 43 minutes that, that there was additional productivity per day for those that stayed at home? You were happy for that. The model worked for productivity. The model worked for efficiencies. But you're mandating that they have to come back to the office. Everybody, no exception. What happened to the hybriding stuff? I mean, I know even just talking with Ed that as they're rolling back into their protocols, they're fine with people working from home but still require them to be in the office a certain number of days per week. Like for him, it's two. You know, so that there's still that, and I hate using buzzwords, synergy, you know, uh, that, that that ability to dialogue, uh, the old yeah. word, is over the is water water, which doesn't exist anymore, it is a thing. over the, the smoothie bar, um, you know, di things that happen because of the interactivity that is in, in person it creates. And we all know that value. We know that that exists. Yeah. But by the same token, um, you can't rely on it that that's the, that is the divine spark for everybody all the time. There's some amazing creative things, I think, that have come through us all being at home as well. I just don't think they've been represented as, as historically uh, valuable as they were prior to COVID, where people were having to, um, you know, be in one-on-one -on -one situations for the, those conversations to happen, I guess. so. Well, every business will have to come to their own decisions on what's going to work best for them if even if you're doing the hybrid, I'm sure that they those people are going to have events and meetings and things that will stimulate our hotels yeah. uh, as well. 
You know me, I've been back on, I got back on the road last month. So yeah. As as I possibly could. Uh, and we had a team meeting. And so I got, um, you know, a couple of us together and the work that we were able to do and accomplish, there's no way with my, with my, with my zoom multitasking, even right now that I would be able to turn it off and do that type of like deep dive strategy work that we were doing. Right. And people realize that, but I can also tell you at the same time, I forgot. I mean, the airlines you can tell are struggling too. I had in my two trips, I had canceled flights. My one little measly direct flight from Colorado to Denver, you know, was almost $600. So I felt, <laughs> I felt used and abused. And then when they canceled my flight from Atlanta back home, they're like, um, you know, we'll get you on a flight in about 24 hours, 36 hours, maybe. And I was like, wait, what? like, if you bump me, you can put me on a flight in like an hour, not like 24 to 36 right. hours later. Well, um, that, 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 that brings up, I have two questions to this. One is this impact of Delta shutting down a lot of their flights. So did America. a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's not just an inconvenience on certain, uh, uh, routes. It's across the board, including international. So here's my question to this. They do not have enough pilots to go back to pre-COVID demand levels, but they got all the money from PPP to keep everybody on payroll. So where'd the pilots go? <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> Wait, I mean, you know, asking for a friend kind of thing. It's like, if you're having to cut your flights down because you don't have pilots, yet you had the money to pay the pilots, which government gave you, then mm -hmm. where the hell the pilots go? And, and I understand there's a lot of people that are shifting jobs and careers. Don't get me wrong. But I think pilots are pretty much dedicated to their craft. I'm thinking yeah, once, you once you start flying a plane, kind of <laughs> kind of like doing it. <laughs> I don't think they're going to go and pick up insurance sales like this. I don't know. I uh, With Delta, I had some credits um, left over from flights I'd canceled. Um, but online, it wouldn't let me use the credits. Like the, uh, kept on saying, like, you have to call to use this credit, which I never want to call. I right. called three three days in a row one time i was on hold four hours um one time i was on hold six and the other one the estimated wait time was like eight hours so i just hung Holy up but i mean shit. you I actually stayed on hold that long huh you actually left a fine i mean i realize you probably just left it there on speakerphone and set it I aside did. but you actually did that for four hours i did and i would have stayed longer had my God bless her. My mother-in-law, we were at the dog park. And I'm like, here, hold the, hold the phone. And she grabbed it and hung up. And I was like, no, no, no. Bless her. She saved you. She was like, did I do something? And I was like, no, but oh, after okay, three grandma. days, okay. I was afraid the flight prices didn't go up. So I had to go and book them at full price. Um, yeah. because the other problem was I had credits for my son and credits for myself. And for me to be able to itinerize the reservations and him being on my pre, I had to book the reservations together. But you had to book, you know, his had to be booked separate to use the credits. And I couldn't use them on the uh, same reservation. Uh, so, so so, here's another fun little mix to the dialogue on this. Um, it, it came up in a clubhouse conversation. Actually, I think uh, Ed and Stewart brought it up yesterday on the clubhouse. Is um, the expected satisfaction, the, the expectations of people's travelers is up 44% over pre-COVID as to the expectations that they have in travel. Quality of, of service levels, that it's not lesser, okay? But you add also that people's expectations of service levels should be at as also the same as it was pre-COVID. There is, a, it was almost 82% or something, there was some fractional amount of people traveling right now have higher or equal expectations to their travel prior to COVID. Mix that into the realities of what we're dealing with right now of we're actually worse in service, less in service quality, less in service capability, less in talent for us to do. So we're on the absolute opposite spectrum of what we can provide in, pre in comparison to pre-COVID uh, services. And yet the audience right now is at an all-time high looking for be it better than. And Who did that survey? Who were they surveying? I'm going to have Ed share. Actually, Stuart, had, it, it was a Myrtle. It was something Myrtle Beach was, was in as well. So he, it was a survey that he participated in and had information on. So I, he said he's going to post it. So I'll see where it goes. But it's a, it's an interesting. It was a, uh, oh, you know, um, um, you know, Amir on uh, uh, Dean. You know, Amir. He, he, yeah, okay. Amir Alon. Yeah, it oh. was his survey. It was his survey. Ah, well, that, uh, that's very interesting. I, I, can't, it's hard to imagine how anybody would think that they're going to get better service than 
prior to COVID when everybody for- knows how challenged the industry is at this I time. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that they do. I mean, I think like my family, I'm like the only person that works in hotels. So even throughout the whole pandemic where I'm like, I know all these people been laid off and furloughed. My family, I'm like, I asked my mom and my sister, I'm like, can you name one person that's been, their job's been impacted by the pandemic? They could not name one single person except for me. Huh? I think that there's a whole subset of people that have no clue what's happening in our industry. But you know yeah. what? I don't, I don't, I, I turn on the news every single day you know probably we have cnbc on more than than other things but every single day there are people talking about the hospitality industry and 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 what it's been through and the recovery and what's reopening and what's closed and all the challenges regarding covid it's a story that i never I never had one day that I didn't see somebody talking about it. But you pay attention yeah. to it because you care about it. Like there's, you know what I mean? Like It's possible. And so it's like a used car ad. I mean, if you're not buying a car, you're not paying attention to the ad. And yes, anything you hear, hospitality or travel or service, you'll, you know, you want to tune in. Yeah. But just if as a sure. human being, I'm going to restaurant after restaurant and restaurant. So I can't tell you how many times I've been turned away from restaurants where they maybe had 30%, 40% occupancy inside. Now, in fairness, by the way, though, to this expectations thing, if you're going to charge me $500 per night, yeah, I do kind of have some expectations. That's true. You, you, you mm-hmm. better figure your stuff out right. before you charge me $500 a night. You betcha. Yeah. <laughs> and also, too, to this, and, and I know this sounds terrible to say, and I'm not trying to, 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 to diminishize people's perception. Until it happens to you, it doesn't have the reality of impact. And I say that from a perspective yeah. that we're watching their 2,300 plus mass shootings year to date. And yet, because it's not either down in your neighborhood or in your local information, it doesn't, you don't realize the horror that's going on right now. Yeah. And I'm not making this as a dramatic statement other than the fact that there's this, this numbness of, of until it affects you directly until, okay, a personal example, me going out to a restaurant, you know, going to a restaurant that we went out with friends and uh, the portion got smaller, the price doubled, there was extra uh, fees that were added to it and the service that was, it wasn't even called service. It was, it wasn't even, it wasn't even that it was, it was some feeble attempt to try to get somebody's attention for something you ran out of uh, an hour beforehand while you waited an hour to get to a table that was, they over, they oversold themselves. They, they didn't have the service to handle the people and so forth. And, and, you know, we're sitting outside and everything else. And it's just, it's one of these things where they're giving you the attitudes like, Hey, you know, it's all the best we can do. Or, you know, you get the definite opinion. They're trying to make up for lost revenues and I understand that I do. I, Business, I understand it, but, Jeez, I mean, a uh, $8 burger is now $16 plus COVID cleaning fee mandatory tip that even, you know, we're party of two didn't count for. And uh, all the other things that they want to tag to you and the portion even got smaller and the food was average at best anyway. And you're sitting there going, wow, went from a $30 couple thing to a $60 couple thing. No, thanks. I'll just stay home and cook and have friends over. You know, they're hurting themselves in that sense. And the service wasn't, even if the service was good, you know, yeah. Yeah. still would have made up for it. Yeah, I was talking to Craig Poole yesterday, who is the, uh, that's my, that's my upcoming podcast, maybe, maybe even today it might be released. <laughs> I was interviewing uh, Craig Poole, who was a uh, general manager of the year from the uh, American uh, Hotel and Lodging Association, and just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, hospitality leader. And he said he was uh, coaching somebody who he wanted to help uh, be successful as a general manager at another hotel. And he said, look, if you're not able to manage with your team at this high level of occupancy, you've got to bring the level of occupancy down until you have something that you have a system, you can manage and everybody knows their place and, and, and you have enough people to do everything that needs to be done to have it great. And then, you know, start to build that up again. It doesn't make sense to have your house on fire and have people miserable and leave. Both the guests and the employees are going to be frustrated by that. If you're building customers for life, 
you know, bring it down to the mm-hmm. level where you can handle it because you're not doing yourself any favors. They, they, they we, definitely, and I know Dean, go ahead and I'll have well, just say we, We've gone, you know, we've heard this, this terminology over the past year of the revenge travel, right? People that are desperate and ready to go. And now it's kind of shifting to the revenge on the traveler where we're, yeah. hey, I mean, look, folks, don't take it out on me because you've had a rough year. I get that it's been a rough year and we want to help you out, but let me come and have a good experience for crying out loud. Mm. Yeah, oh. you know what? Um, I would like to ask anybody who's out there listening, who is a hotelier and has had examples of people blowing up at the front desk and yelling at them. I would love for you to reach out to me at Adele at AdeleGutman.com and share with me Give me the details on what the exchange was like, because it's very hard for for me to comprehend from the outside that somebody was actually what, which is what I hear. Oh, they're yelling at us because it's raining outside or they're yelling at us because there was traffic um, or they're yelling at us for something that is completely outside our control. Really, there's got to be something more underlying that. There's well, we, got. Yeah, go I mean, I agree, I agree with you because, it, 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 in the sense of, there's a lot of it. They're not just entitlement of I'm finally going out and traveling, but there's a lot of anger for having been restricted to what they used to do. We know that from just a cultural perspective, we as a society are frustrated with what we had to, to go through from whatever perspective of impact it had on us, uh, and others more profound. You know, the more profound are the ones that didn't get to see family members that passed. Or, or family at all at a time that, you know, I have, I have retiree friends that are down here and they feel like their a year was stolen from their life because they could not do anything that they retired to do. And n- not having anything to occupy your time outside of what you already had planned, which is going in an RV and going somewhere, or going on a boat and doing something, or going traveling and doing something, and all those things have been taken from you. There's an inherent anger associated with it. And we had this conversation on the live show many times. We've been there together where, you know, Talking to the fact that, that the person freaks out that the coffee free the free coffee in the lobby runs out, uh, and they're, 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 the world's terrible and they're screaming, you know. It, but the worst part of it is, is that people are getting physical about this. Look at the flights of people that are attacking the service members of that of that flight, the attendants and so forth. You know, wantonly fighting for so forth. We we have political polarity. We have emotional polarity, we have entitlement. It doesn't make it too weird when you start thinking about these things that the percentage of people expecting a better experience is because we've been enticing them this whole time for those that have been continually marketing about when you get to travel, look, what are you looking forward to doing? Where are you looking about going to do? We've been trying to keep that interest going with them thinking they're gonna come purchase with us. So their, their, their effort, that final decision to go out and do this or be able to go do this only heightens their expectations. And anything that that normally would have been just brushed off as, oh, yeah, so the cab was smelly when I was in it. No big deal. Turns into, oh, my God, can you put in have some sort of spray in this thing? You know, people are going to go ballistic over the strangest of things. Um, but our teams need to be well trained to know how to handle that. But I think also it's going to affect how we market ourselves right now. Uh, right now, it's just putting rates and dates up. I mean, for those who have the demand, I mean, it's just your availability is key and paramount and being in front of people like on MetaSearch and so forth, where they're that decision model of what's the best opportunity for me to go to that market. The brand loyalty, product offerings and things, I think you're taking a farther back seat to prioritizations of do they even have a room? First off, do they even have a room for me to stay because of that of the demand cycles? And after that, now let's see if it fits with what I need or is it too far out of town? Yeah. There was a there was a a post from a general manager recently who said actually it was the director of sales a director of sales saying I'm I'm alone at the front desk there is one housekeeper and uh, one other person I I don't know what it was and uh, I've I've I fixed a toilet I'm alone at the front desk and I fixed a toilet and I fixed some air conditioning and I've escorted somebody out of the building who's a trespasser and I did something else in the in the in the laundry room this is a director of sales is this what he signed up for he's working his shift and and more every day and he 
surely must feel completely abandoned by his brand, by his um, management company, uh, because he's running 90 something percent occupancy when he doesn't have the team to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are the people from the management company coming in to help out? No. And that goes a little bit to what we're talking about where, okay, so we, we say that the, we, it's a very apparent that these companies are trying to make up for lost revenue. And we know that. And it's very great for us to think that we take the advice of experts that say, you should not sell past your service levels. You should not, as you say, try to serve people in a burning house. Um, but the reality of it is, is that we as an industry have this multiplicities of responsibility. We have the ownership of the building that wants the return on investment. And the market's coming back where that looks realistically as, as something that they can begin to get again. So they don't have to keep eating lost revenues. Uh, you have the management company who are tasked to that optimization. To your point, Adele, are they showing up and running front desks? You know, uh, no, they're, it's easy to tell somebody to go clean a clogged toilet. It's a lot harder to go do it yourself. Sorry, you just, it's one of those things. And it's great character building if you get to do that in front of your staff that they realize that you're willing to do what you're asking them to do. There's teachable moments. And then the third part of it is this brand. Brands looking to recover their marketplace. They're looking to recover their, their, their space. And so you have everybody above you not caring about the realities of what you're functioning and doing. Not and so caring. Do well, the OSs in not there, caring is the right yeah. way to call that. It, it's very difficult. And, and we're all taught this. as We all say, don't leave money on the table. And right now they're in this scenario where literally there's a table in front of them and there's cash sitting on top of it. And we're telling them, no, you're too full. You probably shouldn't do that. You can't service it properly. You should, if you really got to be disciplined to say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really but you know what, how, how valuable is that director of sales who's willing to roll up his sleeves and do anything it takes. Yeah. And do you think that he minds doing it for a while? I bet he's happy to, to, to say, yes, I can. But there's a point where, you know what? I'm not being appreciated. There are other opportunities available. This isn't what I signed up for. It's clear that nobody at this company cares about me and I'm going to go someplace else. No. But at the end of the day for you, them, it's, it's any horse can plow a field. I mean, even a racehorse. You know, it, it, the ownership is, I mean, wait, Stephanie, you want to say something? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to address like, I know that there's like customers and guests out there that are maybe more vocal, but I mean, that existed before. I don't think that component, like shitty guests that are complaining about stupid stuff. I don't think that, I mean, there may be a larger percentage right now, but I don't, I just don't feel like that component's ever going to go away. There's always going to find be people that complain about something. And Lauren, to your point about, you know, having those people trained. I mean, I used to work in a restaurant where a hotel restaurant, we had 1100 rooms. We would sometimes crank out like 600, you know, you, if you had a group and they would all, the convention would all break at one time and everybody, all 400 people want to get fed at the exact same time. You know what? It takes magic and skill. And it was a challenge to me to, you know, like turn that guest around or figure out what that underlying issue was. So, but I think that's, I don't know. I just feel like there's always going to be complainers. Like if you think you're going to yeah, ever be in a world that you don't have guests complain for stupid stuff, then that's not, that's not reality. True. You know what? I can tell you though, from experience, I know what it's like to go from having this many complaints to having this many complaints. And believe me, it is life changing. And it is so much easier to manage when you learn to um, fix the system. Because, you know, you're always, you're, you're usually dealing with a staff of people who want to do the right thing. So it's, you have to look at the, your process, your communications, the system, and, and the mindset. Because I tell you what, there are just a lot of people who will just say, oh, those stupid guests, <laughs> you know, what's wrong with them? But you, but but the people who are winning are the ones that say that person's in a lot of pain. I'm a healer. 
I'm going to, I'm going to help them feel better. I'm going to help transform their attitude. And it think, is a marvelous skill. I think also though, but we have a couple of leaks in our system that we didn't have as prevalent as before. I completely agree with you, Steph, in the sense that there's always going to be those people that are like, you can't make it sunshine enough on them. They're just not going to make always. a difference. They're just mad. And they're mad for things we can't fix. And there's nothing we can fix that can make them not mad. But I think also our industry has a couple of things. And Adele, to, to your point, so yes, it's good. But we are dealing with less soldiers now. Uh, a lot less soldiers. And we are dealing with people that take your DOS example. You know, it's not a matter of them going to another competitor that might be offering something grass greener on the other side. They just might leave the business. They are torched out Indeed. and they're done. And they're not wanting to do what they were doing before. And a lot of people that were working in our industry, which as a stepping stone industry, have decided to just go and get the education they need while they have the time to do it and the money's to do it because they're getting the, the, the aid that they're getting from the government. And they're literally not coming back to the jobs that they used to have in the process of what they're used to do. That being said, I think optimistically, as the money flows, so, so to what was it? What is uh, Stuart's favorite thing that he like? He got a, where a, focus a, goes, energy flows. There it is. And so I think with it right now, as the cash begins to come back into some hotels, we're going to get a polarity of what the result is. There's hotels that are just going to take the money and cough for it. And then there's other hotels that are going to take it and use it for the vehicle that they wanted to do, the improvements they wanted to do that they couldn't financially do earlier, like improve their tech stacks and improve their marketing and improve their staffing and improve their the logistics of what they did stuff with. And they're going to be the smart ones. They're going to take advantage of the fact that they have cash flow to do that because a lot of good companies just were not in good financial position to make the changes. You know, I remember talking to people, it was like, yeah, I get you, Lauren, man. I'd love to make my website over again. And I love to, we don't have the money. We're literally sitting on whatever cash we have to pay our overheads that we can't afford right now. Now that they have cash flow, I think that they might reevaluate the opportunity to address some of those things. So I think there's going to be opportunities. After they pay there. the bank. After, after they pay the, the bank. bank. Exactly. After, they, after pay they pay, they pay their the salaries. Pay. Yeah. And, and so, um, and then we're actually adding additional burdens to them because now everybody's talking about fair wages and what you need to pay. So just when they begin to get financial recovery by cash flow, now they're being hit with higher bills. You got to have some empathy on their side, too. It's easy to bash at the idea that they're saying, make money while we can. There's money, to deem your point, there's money in the middle of the table. It's hard to resist the action. You know, and they know that they're damaging, to tell your point, their long-term value proposition with their lifetime value guess. And in some ways, they're willing to burn that currency to do what they want to do now for with purpose. We tend to highlight the ones that are just doing it in an abusive, self-serving way, like you're just pocketing the money. And like there's a ownership group that I deal with. One hotel is the racehorse. It's totally in groove, making tons of money way over the top. They haven't expanded the team for a couple of reasons. They can't find anybody. And secondly, they're not so eager to because they're running so lean right now, okay, that they're making better margin. But by so doing, they're torching their, their crew there. They're, the crew is going to probably end up quitting. They see that as collateral damage. They just see it as, you know what, we'll lose them. Sure. But there's other people we can find is their mentality. I'm not agreeing with it. I'm just saying their mentality is we'll lose them. Sure. But we're going to get the margin we need. But it's keeping the other four hotels that don't have the demand alive. That money is going right over to a balancing act between all their properties right now. It's paying for everybody else. It's their business choice. And as much as it, it's terrible to see that happening, you know, the DOS at the front desk, you, the, the, the reality of it is, is that there's no Calvary over the hill for these people. There's no ownership that's going to come in saying, oh, we're going to fix this problem for you. It's like, if you survive, we'll compensate you. If you want to leave after you've done all this work, hey, great life. That it, It's terrible, but it's reality for that for that environment, you know? Now, I, I do wonder where, so we're, so we're in this situation right now where we've got a bubble in, in travel and, and we hear about it on the news every day like Adele was saying, right? It's not a day that goes by we can't hear about, hey, travel starting to recover, cruise ships now taking reservations and booked at X percent of what they were and all this exciting news and everything. And, and as we said earlier, we fear there's this drop off coming in the fall. Uh, but to what degree does our sensationalism of it right now actually help us? Because mm -hmm. the more you talk about, kind of like you said, where focus goes, no, where focus yeah. Where focus energy. goes, energy flows. Thank I think you. that okay. that's a Tony Robbins quote, but I'm not okay. sure. Okay. 
But using that same principle, though, if if we continue to talk about it, and I don't mean but just we, I mean the industry, the media, and everything. If we continue to talk about it and evangelize it that, hey, travel is coming back, does that make it come true? Does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, and that that tends to make more people want to travel? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm hopeful, knock on wood, that that's our saving grace come fall. But what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? I think social media is incredibly powerful that if if we're putting out beautiful pictures of beautiful places and uh, and and sharing experiences that have that are positive about our visits in places people will go oh look they're having fun doing that I feel great about booking it because I can see other people are there and they're happy and they're content and they feel safe and they're getting good service. I think social social proof is definitely one of the things that's going to pull us through all the way through to a stronger a stronger industry tomorrow. Uh, and the negative comments not not helping anybody. <laughs> yeah. I, it's it's a weird mix because I know there's screen fatigue going on for a lot of people, and and as much as I prop I'm a proponent of hybrid events and hybrid things, I also think there's a possibility. I'm not saying for certain, but the possibility that there's going to be a bit of a, a rubber band effect on people's technology engagements, unlike before. We've come very reliant on the communication mediums of what we use and do. And we still are in a culture of people wanting to overshare what it is that they do. Like, look at me, look at me, look at me kind of stuff, the selfie selfie thing. Um, but I think also for one of the first times, we might have a negative use factor for people where, that they're looking for open fields and trees and mountains and grass and or, or, or venues that are not at home and things. I think there's that aspect. I think Steph is smart, does dead on for there is going to be a, a, at least a, a cliff of some demand come after Labor Day. I think if timed well, the international market might soften that cliff because if it opens up the way Canada thinks it's going to open up, the way EU is going to be able to reciprocate what it's opened up for the U.S. traveler backwards, where the U.S. is someplace that people can make the destination easier to. Because right now, we can travel to EU right now. We can go. People from EU can't travel to us. Right. It's a one way flow right now. And so and I've, I've had some conversations with people over in the EU on our clubhouse and, and just friends we know, you know, uh, that are I asked them, I says, do you think there's the ugly American perspective of people? You know, here I am, American wandering around doing whatever you can't do in countries you can't go to. And he'd be like, oh, to the hell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're going to be upset with us that we can walk and frolic around because we got vaccinated. They don't even have vaccination availability, perhaps, or whatever it is. And, and yet they see us squandering that vaccination. We're, we're almost at a dead stop now in vaccination protocol. I mean, they can't give this stuff away, literally, you know. And, and meanwhile, other countries are starving to get their first dosages. They're in the single digit vaccination protocols. You know, the only thing that's holding Canada back in their timetables is the fact that they're, a, they're, they're getting vaccinations out. They've already uh, halved our double vaccination percentage of population in the first month of them getting vaccinations. We took six months to do that or five months to do that, you know, and, and now we're putting it down where you can go to the local drugstore to get this stuff. It's just silly. The the perception issues that are going on in the world were like, are you kidding me? I'm dying to get a vaccination, almost dying to get a vaccination, you know, and yet you guys are walking around turning it down because you think it's against your personal opinions. And what the hell is that about? So, yeah, you know, it's still heartbreaking what's happening in India. One of my developers, oh. was like, I got to, you know, I've got to take a. um I got to go dark. My, you know, my, his brother-in-law and mother-in-law both just passed away. And he was like, I, you know, I would have done anything to get the vaccine to save my family, you know? Yeah. And it just, you, you, yeah. It's just it's, pulling at the heartstrings. And yeah. yeah, there's a lot of horror that we have yet to hear the stories of because even, and this is just a blatant government sucks mentality conversation. They're not even reporting it properly. They're saying, unless he died at a hospital, diagnosed with it already, we're not counting it. Meanwhile. Well, that's what that's what he said. He said, we're lucky in a place that we have actually have access to hospitals. He's like, and we have the funds to do that. If you don't have, you know, there's two sides of the coin in India. One, you have to have access to a hospital. Number two, you have to have the money to, you know, basically pay out of pocket. Um, 
he's like, but they're over on. He said, most people are just dying at home because mm -hmm. they don't have any other choice. Yeah. And, you know, they, and they actually made the BBC news that there's a volunteer organization that is getting larger where local people, because the government won't do it, which is appalling to think that they're as a local uh, group, they're running around going to homes to bury the dead. Oh, God. Not, not bury the dead, burn the dead. Government thing, it's an infrastructure problem. They don't have, it's not, I mean, I'm sure the government could if they would if they yeah. could, they just don't have the infrastructure. Yeah, the government, you know, there's a person that died in their little hobble of where they're at, and 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 because of their status, and, and they, 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 nobody's doing it. There's no family to take care of the body. And there's literally this volunteer organization that's going over and accumulating these people that have passed in their homes and to be able to give them the proper burial or funeral, you know, pyre and so forth. And so it's just the loss is staggering. And 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 it, 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 in places like that, they, they just oh, just you can be mad at everybody in the world for doing this kind of stuff. But you know, when it comes to these things, and funny enough that last night Renee and I were fascinated with a show on Smithsonian of the Indian weddings because as as a food and beverage person, times past, I've had Indian weddings at our hotel, and they are amazing affairs. But mm -hmm. also, no, you better dedicate your hotel because your hotel will smell a certain way for a long period of time because of the cult cuisine that they want, you know. You know the, the types of food that they want are very spice oriented, and that 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 smell permeates everything. So you really and as do the Jewish community when you do Jewish events, Adal. I mean, there's there's protocols you have to go with, and you got it, it's really weird to go talk to your kitchen crew and say, "I'm sorry, as a girl, you can't handle the food today." <laughs> you know, oh. it's just it is a religious thing. It, 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 it was you know, it just it, it, you said you're going. I'm not trying to be. Uh, bias anyway, but this is a, re a restriction of their requests for who runs their food. And, and the rabbi will be showing up. And this is how they want it laid out. And this is what he has to prove. What you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go with these things. And the, and the thing is, you're like, well, we'll just charge them more. You do, because it is extra work. But they're like, sure, as long as you do it. The way, if you do what we ask and do it the way we want. I mean, I remember literally, no exaggeration, for Wendy and Wedding, we had to figure out how to get a horse into the ballroom. Uh, that's the most fun part. Oh, except for the dancing. Are the dancing the most amazing. The, part. the parties are incredible because they get so caught up with it. The whole staff gets invited in. I mean, it's like, put the tray down, come dance. I mean, it's just. <laughs> so much fun. So much fun. It is a fun. celebration. It is truly, if you have never been to any uh, an Indian wedding, uh, a bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, uh, any of those things, it is truly just joy. On it is, it is you leave there happier with life. Honestly, it is. Uh, I wish we could have a program where Americans who who are vaccinated and want to travel can bring a hundred doses or whatever right. it is a vaccine somewhere and or, or sponsor it really in a way yeah. sponsor it. Yeah. i mean obviously some of these yeah, things have to have certain stuff. conditions yeah <laughs> i mean i would feel so great about adding that as a component to my travel mm -hmm. and yeah. i think a lot of people would it's I, almost like a, 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 a i think that's a customs nightmare <laughs> yeah all right well yeah <laughs> excuse me what is in the coffee beans mrs adele Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> but you know if somebody it, it, it's it this is crazy this is crazy that yeah. that the walgreens you go into the walgreens and somebody rushes up to you say wouldn't you like to get vaccinated today and look yeah. like, i already have but we don't have anybody taking the vaccine and we're not even seeing going back to our marketing discussion we're not even seeing the impact of how this is going to affect those that aren't vaccinated and can't prove it to those that are vaccinated and can because Okay, it's one thing for Governor DeSantis of Florida to go over and say, we're going to find any company that tries to go over and do a vaccination passport. The reality is he's a little fraction of a small part of a country that's in the middle of the world. And he can't control all the other facts that EU says, hey, you want to come to us? You got to prove you're vaccinated. You, first off, you got to get tested before you get on the plane, prove that you already have the vaccinations and get tested when you get off the plane. That's minimum stakes in the conversation to travel right now is prove you don't have it, prove you got vaccinated, prove you don't have it when you get here. That's how that. do we oh sorry i didn't no no go ahead how do we invite international people to come and get vaccinated as part of their experience the problem is get to them? get here they have to be vaccinated right now they can't even leave to get here to get vaccinated but they, that doesn't make any sense we should just be vaccinating them 
uh, right at the yeah, airport I know from a logistics on the plane. You know. They have to show their test results before they can get on the plane within 72 hours. Yeah. And, 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 and also too, like in Canada, well, one of the, one of the ways we kept one of the resorts or the hotels alive was we were a quarantine hotel, an authorized quarantine hotel, which required very rigid things to do to, to, uh, Stephanie's dialogue, the other Stephanie's dialogue about proving you're in the room and that you didn't leave the room and stuff. They had to set up monitors on the doors that the door opened. They knew the door opened. You know, they had to go through a lot of protocols to ensure that they were verifying that this person stayed in their room. There was a designated area that each floor could go to to get out of the room if they want to take a smoke break or something like this. Or uh, if they just need to get exercise outside of the room, they had a certain amount of time in a certain location that they would have to call, be verified that they were leaving, door opens, verified, and when the door was reopened or closed again to verify that they went back in during the prescribed time. This was like, I wouldn't say prison, but close, you know. And this and was the, just Canada we're talking about, right? This is Canada! Yeah. <laughs> this is not one of the more, you know, draconian countries in the world. You know, <laughs> one of the things was is that they don't know what to do with, they're worried about um, alcohol consumption in public places now because it was banned for the whole long time. And they just opened up that there were certain times where you could buy package, not go out for package. They're worried about what it's going to be like now in this phase one that's coming in July, where you can actually go out past 10 p.m. at a bar. They don't know what that's going to do again because nobody's done it for so long. They're thinking there's going to be drunks in the street or something or whatever. But here's the here's the logistics they have a problem with. And this actually came up in the news before in another place. Uber doesn't almost exist. They already had a hard time in Vancouver. I think they had limitations of what they even had as options. They only had suburbs and so forth. Taxi services that were impacted by this don't have taxis as well. And municipal transportation was limited also for availability. There's been stories already in the U.S. where people have been stranded at an airport because even though they had a rent-a-car and they're a prestige relationship with the rent-a-car, they ain't no cars. And then they went to say, well, I got to go get an Uber. Ain't no Ubers. And because of Uber's impact on the taxis, weren't no taxis. And then the, because the taxis outlawed the municipal travel from getting to the airport, trains and buses and so forth that they didn't have, there was no municipal travel. Literally, there was somebody, unless you wanted to walk with a suitcase on the side of an interstate, you couldn't leave the airport. There was nobody to drive you anywhere. That happened to my employee in Dallas. There was 75 people in line at the car rental, and they just walked out and said, reservation or not, we don't have any cars. We don't have any cars for the next 12 hours. Like, wow. You couldn't get a car. He had to get a friend to come pick him up, but they, and he couldn't get a reservation. He couldn't pick up a car until Monday morning. That was on. He got told that Saturday afternoon, and couldn't pick up a car until Monday morning in Dallas. Wow! 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 You know, I I have I have to go, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you why. I I rented after I left New York because of COVID, and I uh, rented a house here for, since last summer. And we had been saying to them the whole time, we're gonna we're gonna join up for another year. And everything was fine. And suddenly we got a note saying, Oh, you have to be out in six weeks because we're gonna sell. Because you know what? We just didn't expect that the market was gonna be so high wow. for for selling homes now. We just have to take advantage of it. And uh yeah, and there are so little that's available. Oh yeah. Uh, so I have to go out and do some uh house hunting right now super wow. quick. Now, are you guys <laughs> looking to buy a house close. or you're looking just to rent one still? Uh, you know what? I don't want this to happen to me again, so I mm. think I'm going to buy. Yeah. Uh, if I can find something I can I can well I, I have the option of doing either whatever seems to be the right thing whatever, fits, whatever yeah. we can find that that makes sense. Well, the nice part is you've yeah. been able to spend enough time to enjoy where you decided you want to be because yeah, it, it, the house, that's a whole other thing that from a marketing perspective for us, you know, this this relocation of population, we haven't really even seen the full impact of what that means yet. Uh, where down here in Southwest Florida, the we are the we were the number one city for, I think, three months and we're number, within the top five for the past year of relocation uh, destinations down here because taxes for you know we don't have state taxes um and 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 the market for purchases i mean you know somebody from california that sold their little two-bedroom house for 2.2 million they can buy a mansion here you know and then some kind of stuff and i think the same effect in dallas and places like that where yeah, it's it, the same. yeah and it just you know and then the housing market is just amazing but down here 
literally we went over and and we've been looking for a house for quite a while because we've been living in the condo and have rent our office space here and we were looking for a house to kind of maybe consolidate it over time the houses that we looked at exactly untouched six months ago are twice as much as they are now twice I mean no exaggeration twice it's and more. true it's you know, true for nothing more wood, than just the market demand the wood is an issue apparently people have oh, been yeah. saying you know, it costs it's 10 better times than what as much. It was, but it's still astronomical. They, they, the construction theft down here, because construction is rampant down here. Every place is blowing up because the demand's here. Um, it's on the news all the time where people are going into construction sites, loading up the lumber from the construction site because they're it's so expensive in product. But there's so many influencing factors in what we deal with on this sense. It really, it really is bizarre. Uh, all the variations that we deal with on that, but uh, yeah. So Adele, do you have to leave now, or are you going to leave in a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. say goodbye. But yeah, I, I wanted to say that um, I am going on on uh, Tuesday, uh, whatever day Tuesday is. I can't remember. On Tuesday, I'm going to be doing a presentation for HSMA Europe at. Uh, 2 p.m. Central Time, so it's like 8 a.m. Eastern Time here, okay. uh, live uh, about uh, dispelling myths about uh, reputation management. There is so much false information out there that uh, I want to clean up for people and uh, and and see what if we can sure. put people on the right track again. Uh, so that's going to be fun and in. Uh, it, on July 14th, there's going to be the uh, the uh, Travel Industry uh, Executive Women's uh, Network is having a conference. It's part of uh, BLLA, the Boutique Lodging Association, uh, Women in, uh, in Travel and Hospitality Conference. So I'll be speaking on that on Bastille Day, July 14th. Awesome. And yeah. And June, July 21st, speaking to the HSMA Los Angeles, but everybody is uh, is welcome to join in on that one as well. Uh, so I, I look forward to having everybody there. And most of all, come and watch the Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast. Get great reviews. Uh, it's on YouTube and on uh, what's the travel channel called? <laughs> oh, hospitalitychannel.tv. <laughs> is it on there yet? Oh, so we, we broadcast live right now even. As a matter of fact, you're broadcasting live on e, on, on uh, Facebook for EU already, as well as APAC. We do that uh, with the show every week. We do that live as well. So Fantastic. we've been on we've been on Xbox and PlayStation. That's how sad of, of a yeah. diversification we have. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, Xbox. though. If you're watching this on an Xbox, you know, if you've got that Xbox in front of you, there's probably something else you got to be doing. you got to figure there's got to be something <laughs> else to watch. But we are broadcasting on Twitch for it because – and we can have this whole discussion, but Xbox and PlayStations are turning into their own medium of hardware. Yeah, that's true. Sense of, of, of Netflix, Hulu, all that's there. So if you, you know, rather than having to buy a, a Fire Stick or or, or, or or whatever, you can run it through your Xbox and play. Anyway, yes. Adele, thank you. S uh, safe, all good stuff. Happy hunting, as, as, as Dean said. And uh, we'll put the links. I can get the EU link. So just send me the Los mm -hmm. Angeles link. We'll put it up in the show notes as well. So. Thank you so much. Bye, Dale. Have a great week. See you next week. Bye. Yep. See you next week. So, Steph, I got some brand questions for this on some stuff that just from a perspective thing. Um, we talked about meta search. We talked about travel ads. Those have been levers that they've definitely stepped into, saying, "Hey, we'll we'll match funds, or we'll do up to this amount, or something like this." And then you're seeing other organizations offering SEO correlation to voice of market, which we know um, sometimes gets, anyway, what are the things uh, that you think brand hotels can be doing for themselves other than the lateral social marketing efforts? I mean, is there any other levels or buttons that they can be exercising right now? Um, yeah, I mean, we've had some, some good success with display advertising, specifically with Adara, who has the marketing, who has the Marriott cookie. Um, if you have it, either of you have used Adara, they're Adara, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, I mean, I feel like their data is better. The first party data is better than some other providers, and I feel like their targeting options um, are are better. And we, you know, with it being display, we've seen some much higher than anticipated ROIs for that. Um, the other neat thing that you can do, like because you have the Marriott 
because you have the Marriott pixel, like if you have a, a, a market that has a lot of Marriott's, you can actually retarget to other to people that have searched at other Marriott hotels that didn't book. So it's retargeting, but within your, within your brand, so to speak. Mm. Okay. So um, that's um, been working fairly well. The um, we're doing some other beta tests uh, that, you know, some more on the, um, cause you know, as the cookies go away, we've been testing, you know, like the hashed emails and how to incorporate those, that data um, onto different channels. So um, TBD on, on results with that, but um, there mm -hmm. are options for branded hotels down that route. So leveraging that data points, the same stuff that like Adara has, but using that in email and display and social, you can get more of an omni-channel approach. So I don't mm -hmm. know, Lauren, if you've had any success with that or if I'm going down a rabbit hole, I shouldn't, but. No, 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 Adara, I get a mixed bag. Adara can be outplayed a lot of ways, but if it's the only tool that's being offered, then it's a tool to take. I mean, Adara, the, the issues with Adara in most generalized sense is the first party, third party cookie kind of thing. But with brands, that's kind of a negative issue because, or, ne or a negated point because if brands allowing first party information to be shared with Adara via yeah, for you, then you're really be able to use the, the tools to it. And it does give you options, as you said. And, and so from that positive perspective, the, the thing with it though, is that a well run independent hotel can outperform the gem realities of what Adara tends to offer. Uh, they, they tend to be fat fruit, low hanging fruit, brand rate centric. And as well, because of the relationships they have that that's what they do. Cause they're, they're, they're monetization models based on those kind of things. So they're going to go for the easiest monetizations they can. Um, I, I think that if, if, a, if, if a brand hotel is comparing what they're doing with Adara to an in hotel that doesn't do things for themselves, they can stomp them into the ground because this is state, this is table state conversation. Now you're, you're rebranding functionalities, your multiplicities of, of distribution, or, or, you, if you're not doing it, you're losing because it's not even an option now of, oh, we should maybe think about this. It. Like if you're not doing it, yeah, then then somebody else is taking your business is, at yeah. this point. Yeah. We've done also kind of a going back to foundational approaches, um, which seem to have kind of been lost on the sales team. So like, you know, 101 stuff like, are, you, are we maximizing our relationship with the CVB? Have you talked with the marketing options with your CVB? What are the demand generators? Have you, you know, maintained those relationships? Do you have any experiential stuff that we can use to, you know, partner with them and then be able to kind of catapult that into different. Um, but I mean, it's kind of that. I mean, I feel like we always had that, but I think the sales teams have just been pulled in so many different directions. It's time to take a back to basics approach with like get back in, start seeing people in your market, start re, you know, how can we better utilize those relationships? So the sales yeah. team probably already has it. We're just not leveraging, you know, in the online space, like, mm -hmm. you know, putting ourselves in the newsletter of XYZ demand generator. So just stuff like that, re, you know, what's open, what's, um, and I know that seems overly kind of basic, but it's also, mm. you know, you can only kind of compete within your, compete within your market. So, yeah, no, it's strange that you say only basic, but in all honesty, some people don't do it. It's like, you would think this would be a basic, but it's not, it's, or, you know, common sense is neither. It's like, you know, you, you would think that people were aware that these need to be done, but in fact, they, they, they don't do it. Now, question, are you seeing more people or more of, of the brands looking to focus on their sales efforts? Or are they still waiting for that magical when there's enough business, we have a person to fill the role? You know, it seems like carpet for the horse mentality. It, it, I don't think they realize that if they put somebody back in the chair for sales, allowing them to sell, not running a front desk, as Adele was pointing out, but running sales, that's a huge growth potential outside of the restrictiveness that most places complain about not having options and accesses for marketing sales is an open forum i mean chase what you can you know and to your point sales is a long-term relationship game i mean there's you know just because you have a button a seat answering the phone doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to move the needle in sales right mm -hmm. like if you're not people still i mean even with probably what all of you guys do people will book with who they like and they that's yeah, your product matters and your service matters, but they still like to have that relationship. They're, you're not going to close that deal on the first on the first call. And so many of those, I feel like a lot of hotels just brought back their salesperson like last month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's putting your feet to the fire in terms of, you know, it's like how much have you, it's hard to tell the long-term impact of what you've lost over the last 16 months, not having somebody in that seat. True. Um, 
And and also too, and people don't really account that. I don't think ownership or management companies account for this. With so much changing of the guard, there's a lot of hotels that have yet to fill that chair back up. So even though they may have had a better relationship with a client that you didn't have, that they garnered it and you didn't, it's kind of open season again because those people aren't in a role again and or in a position or may have left the industry altogether. And that hotel hasn't focused on reestablishing those relationships. So if you're proactive in stepping into it early, you might get first chance at these companies that are reevaluating their needs and demands and so forth and where they're doing business when they start doing business again at scale. And if you're Johnny on the spot and you're creating that relationship, even though you didn't have it before, just because you're doing it and the others aren't, there's a huge opportunity of, of, of market share gathering that you can do just by being proactive in that sense. I think that a lot of places don't yeah. look at it that way. They look at, oh, when we get enough phone calls in, we'll put somebody in there to take care of it. It's like, okay, you're waiting for the harvest without having planted yet. Okay. That's totally. Not really well. totally. And I think there's a lot of owners that are trying that, okay, now I'm going to have one person oversee, you know, one, two, three hotels and, you know, there's obviously synergies you can pick up from that, but mm -hmm. um, I think they're having trouble staffing people with any experience as well. And I, I get so frustrated because so many people like post a sales position. They're like, oh, we need, you know, this system's experience or we, yeah. you know, you need. And I'm like, wow, that is so. Why, why is it three <laughs> years? What, what's magic about three years? What's magic about five years? Where, where does that number come from other than maybe you felt that that was asked of you when you first got the role? So you're you know, earning no, well, uh, my, my favorite ones where they want to, where they want a 25 year old with 15 years of experience, you know, <laughs> <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah. Aptitude. And, and you know, man, you're hitting on the cord with me because I just had this discussion about, you know, they, the, a lot of these companies are built selfishly, you know, here's a form, tell us everything we want about you. And we'll tell you whether or not we have a position available. I'm sorry. What? You know, I have choices to make here. I can go places. I can. I, I have skill sets that are are valuable to companies, and I have to prove that. You know, first off, I have to give you all my information before you even tell me if there's something worth my attention from you. And then when you look at job descriptions, ninety percent of it plus, if not all of it, it's all about what the demands are. I want the three to five years experience. I want the, the you know the college education. What what's important about that? I'm not quite sure because you can be a doctor of philosophy for God's sakes. You know, but that has no applicability to the job Degree position. Broadcasting, yay! <laughs> yeah, you know, that made it, far. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that yeah, and, and and all these requirements and nothing about what the job is offering, the culture that you maybe have a great culture in, or or or, or the teamwork, or the or the compensation. What's what's so mysterious about talking about compensation before you even know if the person because it they they've lost the perspective that it's a two way dialogue. It's we have a role. We got to see if you're qualified for us to consider you. Meanwhile, they're turning around going, oh, can somebody help us? Because we can't get any staff. You can't have both most worlds. Either you're opening up to the idea that you can hire somebody that's, I'd much rather hire somebody that has aptitude than they meet the criteria of numerics of, oh, this is, they got the education, they got the years of tenure. Because they could have been terrible at their job, but they sat in a position that nobody cared, so they didn't fire them for it. They could have been terrible at it, just but they got three years in. You know, they didn't they didn't do anything cellular. They just lived and existed and, and survived in the environment. Uh, so I think this is the time to really open up what happens. Go ahead, Dean. I mean, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here because, by the way, I agree with what you're saying. But just to play devil's advocate, aptitude is difficult to measure. I, I can't put a specific I, I can't put numbers to it. Right. Uh, and, and I'll use a really good example. I can remember many years ago, I was with a company and we hired a guy that we thought had great aptitude. He was very personable, uh, had all the traits, you know, and it felt good. And my gut, this was a good employee. He was horrible. Okay. Mm. <laughs> you know, so how do you quantify aptitude? You can't. And that's one of the problems that especially these large corporations have is that when that HR person goes to hire somebody and says, I want to offer this person the job, they have to be able to put it in writing and say, well, we hired him because this, this, and this, right? We there can't are, say we hired him because it felt good. <laughs> that's, a, that's why I've been doing a lot of research on this because in our hiring, I've made some in the last year, maybe I didn't make some great hires and I'm trying to learn from that. And there are, I think that there are some tests like predictive index that will actually measure aptitude. I don't necessarily like the the ones that are about um, 
like Myers Briggs. That isn't what I'm. That doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily like what matter. What color are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, and there's other stuff like. Um, I mean, there's quite there's there's a lot of different tests out there, but I do think there are tests that can potentially measure aptitude in terms of like, do you have a growth mindset? Uh, looking for things like that. And there are certain questions you can at least try to determine if someone has the capacity or desire in terms of learning new stuff. But yeah, you know, it, it's, it's funny you bring it up. It's like, yes, I think, and this is just me being biased to this. I think uh, when you put up things like five years X experience, three years X education or whatever, those are disclaimers for failure. Exactly. They're check boxes. Okay. Yes. Of, oh, well, he met all the check boxes. So you can't fire me for hiring them because yes. it fit the criteria you told me I had to make sure they hit to do this. Meanwhile, they didn't go through. For me, in the interview process was pretty much, I got to your point, Steph, I, there was the intangible discussions. And I would do it in a very, in me personally, but logistic way. First off, my team helped hire the person that was going to work with them. And even if there was going to be, we were hiring for the role of supervisor over them, they had an influence to them because culturally they had to fit in the dialogue. Didn't mean they had to be friends. Didn't mean that they had to go over and be the same, you know, emotional stability or buddy buddies or any or friendly peoples. It means that either they were respecting for what they were being asked to do, that they earned the right to lead them, or that they earned the right to work with them. That was their role in quantifying this person's position potential is they interviewed all of the technical stuff or all of the nuts and bolts stuff that they know day to day would be the part of this person's life. Like, can they actually do SEO if we were hiring an SEO person? Do they actually functionally know how to do this? Do they understand the terminology? Do they understand the process? Not that they're perfect with it unless they're supervisor and they should be. But if they're a team member, the, the nuance of the individual way we did things, they wouldn't be expected to know, but they should understand the basics to know what they needed to learn from there. My discussion with them when I interviewed them was I would create baselines questions. I would see what they were interested in by asking them questions of, you know, what's the favorite thing you like to do kind of stuff? What is it when you, you relax? What do you like to do? And seeing how they emotionally get past their, I'm sitting in front of an interview, I have to answer a certain way where they begin to show a little truism to their interests. I then started asking questions related to what we would be asking them to do and see if that truism of their reaction came in. Were they just as excited about telling me a great story about what they did well? Or was it a rehearsed dialogue that they wanted to make sure was said exactly the way they wanted it to so that, that I would believe them? You know, and you get a feel of whether they truly were what you expected them to be or were they trying to portray themselves the way that they were expected. And that usually worked out pretty well. Very few people ever slip through where they, the only people that ever slipped through that process with me that didn't work out was their work ethic. They were what we thought they were. They just weren't consistently that person. You know, they thrived when they were interested and recoiled when it wasn't too much interesting. You know, that's a that I never found a perfect way to know that consistency of performance through that process. But that was the only uh, Achilles heel that I came out of that was that, yeah, you know, they, these people were problematic in their consistency factor. Well, Lauren, you're probably like me. Like, yeah, you can ask the same questions and you can do the, you know, in terms of looking for that stuff. But I still hire off gut. I hire oh, yeah. I like you within the first five minutes. Then my clients aren't going to like you in the first five minutes. There you go. And then I, you know, and yeah. it, it's a, it's something that's like you either, you see, sometimes you just like, I feel like I've always done that in my hiring. And especially when I worked mm -hmm. in hotels and I was hiring bartenders and servers, you know, it was all about. You know, like, I don't care if you've never used micros. I don't care. If, you know, right. I just need to know. I can teach you that. Yeah, yeah I, that's all yeah. teachable. And uh, I've even thought that way in digital. And sometimes it's almost harder to break bad habits than it is to create fresh new ones from scratch. Yep. Right. But yep. and that, that's why I used to when I was in hotels, I used to love hiring people that had not worked in the industry yet because they saw it from the perspective of the of the guest. It's like, you know. I can see that I'd be irritated if I walked to the front desk and nobody was there. I could see I'd be irritated if my room wasn't clean the way you said it was going to be cleaned or the server didn't come up to the table in time and stuff. And so if I put them in the role of doing that job or being in charge of that job, they're going to be motivated from that perspective. It's like, we don't want this to happen because I know that it's not right. And it's yeah. pretty cool. But yeah, to your point, I, to me, I always used to say, the only thing I can't teach is motivation. At the end of the day, everything else is scalable and scalable. So, I've said the same thing, but I need the the desire and capacity to learn. That's the part that that is the hardest 
definable because the only way that I've been able to do that is almost get really granular focus and say, so what made you want to do that? And if so, what kept you wanting to do that even after you learned what started your reason to doing it? You know, like, okay, if I was interested in doing something, when you got to the point that you understood at the level that was your inspiration, why did you continue on? What what turned from a passive interest in SEO to a passion to do it the best? You know, where did that transition point happen? And that's a hard one to get out of as an answer from somebody because they themselves don't know the answer. You have to get it out of the way they tell the story. How did they go from I learned what I wanted to from my interest to now it made me learn what I wanted to do better with it. And that that only comes from them telling stories. I'm a big story interviewer person. Like, yeah, hey, let's spend all the time in the world until you're totally tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> During the pandemic, I talked to a lot of people that wanted to transition from sales to, you know, digital. Uh, I don't know, Lauren, how many of those you talked to, but I can name at least half a dozen. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so you've been doing, you've been director of sales and marketing for the last 20 years. Cool. Love the like, air quotes. It's so true. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what have you, what did you pick up on? Like you had to have some, some interactions. You've had to oversee an agency. Like what have you grasped? Like what does digital marketing mean to you? And there, and I, I was flabbergasted. Like if you actually had this desire pre pandemic, did you, and, and you can't even pick up on like the basics of what marketing like means to a hotel. And I wanted, you know, and I'm just like, I don't want to like crush these people's soul by any means, but I'm like, if in the last 20 years, you didn't like, you know, I, I, you, you know, didn't like do any marketing, <laughs> you didn't do any marketing. And, and now you want to like suddenly jump careers and they're like, you know, can you, can you, can I do an internship with you? And I'm like, I don't, I don't think that you have this growth mindset. If in the last 20 years you haven't picked up on anything, you can't regurgitate that to me in any form, shape or capacity. And just cause you took the Cornell certification, um, which I, I love Bill Carroll and the certification's great. Like it's not going to teach, you're not going to be able to walk out that door with that certification, be able to do digital. No. And, um, and you, you, boy, you hit it on the head. Yeah. I'm sorry. I wasn't the one to help you. No, 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 no. You hit it right on the head because it is very true. I've had on, on, on an expansion of that idea. I have a lot of people that reached out to me and said, look, I want to do what you're doing consulting wise. I want to be out there to do your stuff. I I tell you, it, 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 I, I go over to talk to them and, and this is no narrative to anybody that may relate to them being part of this story. But the um, so you're middle manager with a brand company. OK. Uh, what did you actually do? that you're responsible for. I mean, obviously the reports came to your desk. Okay, you're obviously aware of what they were doing for you. You're obviously aware that you had a responsibility for making decisions based on what was reported to you. But do you know how to do this? Do you know what it takes to make that? No, but I mean, companies want to would probably want me in that role to, no, no, they can hire an employee to do this. Like you were an employee for where you're at. What is it they're going to pay you as a consultant to do that they can't do from having an internal employee to, well, they may not have somebody that, um, is this qualified to me? Okay, got you. Yeah. The people that say, I just want to be in a role to tell people what to do, but I don't actually want to do it. And I'm like, there's, you're a dime a dozen. Like, yeah, you got to like, be able to do both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a difference of telling people what to do and the ability to go, I'll go plunge the toilet. I can tell you how to do it, but I got to go plunge the toilet because I think there's, at the end of the day, and all of us have this, the only person that's doing the work sometimes is the per, our own hands on the keys. It's us, you yeah. know, so you need to do it. The scaling of it is when you have the ability to get somebody that is as talented, if not more talented than you, that can help you do what you were doing. And then I have to say, that, you know, there's also thresholds of uh, nervousness where when you release the responsibility personally to handle it and trust the person you're entitling it to do it, that that, yeah. OK, if you don't do what you are doing, I can't save it fast enough or well enough to it to make it where my reputation has not been damaged by your, you know, not doing it to completion. That, it reminds me of when I used to have restaurants, handing the keys over my first restaurant that I owned. I remember to the day, handling the keys over to my first hired manager, knowing me when I was a manager, man, I ate whatever I ate, drank whatever I drank, you know what, I'm working my ass off for you. So, you know, uh, yeah, and knowing that I'm handing the keys over to all the food I own, all the equipment I own, all the service, you know, the liquor that I own, knowing that the manager has the ability to do whatever they choose to do, but trusting them that they're not going to be too painful to my company. That was a weird feeling, handing the keys over to what you own to somebody that just gets paid by you. 
it's a weird step. It really is. So yeah, it's it, why it, half my employees have all worked for me before because I obviously have those trust issues. With, yeah, you know, yeah, it, 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 it is. It's, it's, yeah, because you know it can financially hurt you, but it is. It is also eminently rewarding when you're in front of a client and your team outshines you, just totally blows the client away with their insight, their capability, their answers, their dialogue. Their and you're sitting there going, "Yep, yeah, that's my people." <laughs> it is a pretty cool feeling but yeah for the people that because they did it in a corporate environment on somebody else's salary or on, on payroll they feel like oh well i can i can do that for another company and telling them the distinction of doing it for them as a consultant is that you have to be there it's also it reminds me too is when i when i first started being a food and beverage director at a hotel my first job going to a new another hotel as food and beverage director because everybody up to that point applauded my success. They saw me where I started. They were happy that I got to the level that I did. And, you know, they were supportive of me. When I walked in the door of the other hotel, the expectation was, oh, so you're the new food and beverage director. You had to prove that you earned that ability to walk in the door with that title. Not that, you know, you, you didn't have all the history to help you with that. So same too, when you, you were as a consultant, when you walk into the room, you have a bullseye on you from everybody else in that room that thinks they know what you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. You're the it's new guy every time. <laughs> yeah. And they, you have to make sure that you, you know, they're not, they feel, a lot, so a lot of people feel threatened immediately. From exactly. The, yes. From the moment you walk in the door. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and we all have our techniques of doing it. Mine is, you know, when you read the room and you see who's really responsible for the decisions you're talking about, it's not necessarily the boss at the head of the table. It's who he relies on. That's the authority to him that tells him whether or not you're full of crap or not. But also listening to those people and knowing when you can support because you're the new voice. You know, they've been the white noise in the background. They've been saying the right answers perhaps all along but nobody's listening to them. Then you come in and say the same thing they're saying. They're going, what the, f you know, I've been telling you this for six months and you, and because this person that just walked in the door today says the same thing and they're mess. Oh, well, that's a brilliant idea. It's amazing. You suggest and you're sitting there going, what do I think I've been doing? Well, giving and credit to them. I know I just talked with the management <laughs> company. They asked me to speak at their regional meeting this last week. And I went to the, you know, whatever VP of commercial strategy or whatever their, her title is. And I said, what is it that you want to get across that you haven't been able to exactly that you haven't been able to convey? So, you know, I want to say I want to support you in the what you've been trying to get across and either say it from a different perspective or say it a little bit differently or whatnot, because I knew that there were some things where she was just frustrated with not being able to get people on the same page or get somebody to listen to her. So it was more of about, OK, like. I want to make you look good. Like, what do you want? What is it that you want me to, what mm -hmm. is it that you want me to say? And that is a, but you have to have some money that's, it's a delicate conversation to have. It is because you're basically coming into their sandbox and you are taking their authority away, even if it's temporarily. But to your point, which is a brilliant strategy, by the way, Steph, is that you're looking to solicit and endorse the good ideas. Cause I've also asked that question to somebody and they were totally flat out wrong what they wanted. Like, <laughs> dude, they ain't going to work. OK, and now you're faced with the God, I don't want to embarrass them in front of their team members by being contrary to what they've been saying. But by the same token, I need their support so that they buy into what I'm saying they should do. So translating the that's totally whacked to the maybe you should consider this conversation, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> to your point is a delicate conversation. But if they're truly wanting something to move the needle that they know that they're in jeopardy if something doesn't happen right. And if they pl they play off them the being too resistant to what you're doing, that really puts them uh, isolated from their team, that they're just trying to be negative nanny on this process the whole time. And so because of that, they're jeopardizing their security, long-term security by doing it. If you can play to that a little bit and realize like, look, you may not agree with what I'm saying, but here's my rationale and try to rationalize with them and work with them through the process try to find that middle ground that says, I understand what you're trying to do. I think maybe it's at this point of the timeline that that can be considered. Right. So you're not saying no to them, but you're also just putting them in context that these things have to happen first before those things happen. Sometimes yeah. that's another they, way they, just don't know, they may not know what they don't know. Um, so I, I, wrote that, a, I wrote an yeah. article when I was talking with a lot of new on, new consultants during the pandemic that, the, that I wrote 
I dropped in the chat. I saw that. Appreciate it. I'm going to put that in the show notes as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's a delicate balance because ultimately, as a consultant, you're there to create a solution for whatever was the inspiration for your participation. And it's not there to talk about how smart you are. It, it is mind numbing how so many agencies and businesses go into a presentation and most of it's about them before it ever gets to the client. It's like, I literally start my presentations like, we I'll be have. happy to tell you about me if you're interested enough after I tell you what I think you're having me here talk about, which is you. You know, if you're still, if, if I haven't convinced you that I have ideas for you that are helpful for what your motivation is for me being here, then you don't need to worry about what I do or how I got there or why I came up with a stupid name or whatever else is the fodder for most of these agency presentations. Uh, you know, but if I have convinced you enough, then you want to ask those questions at the end of it. I'm here all day. Try the veal, you know, mm -hmm. it, it is, it is because. 80% listen, 20% talk. Yeah, it is yeah. really, and, and being attentive to not just hearing um, them talk, but listening to what they're actually saying. It, what, it, on yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, just, just to what you were saying, it does drive me, I've lost track of the number of corporate RFP pitches that I've seen and I've looked at the decks and the first five slides of the deck are all about the history of the company. Yeah, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we came up with our silly little name when I was drunk one night and I thought about nobody owns this domain. And next thing you know, we called ourselves that and you're sitting there going, like, really? That how is that important right now? Yeah. I still don't have a sales deck. Three years later, I still don't have a sales deck. I don't I, have my decks are literally based on what is your question? Great. Then that's what I'm going to put in content of it. And then mm -hmm. you know, even you know, I used to do this for HSMI a lot, just and it, where I wouldn't talk about it. He's like, look, if you need credentials of why I'm on stage and you're not, I'll be happy to say I've sat in all your chairs. Let's just start from there and we can ask questions later, but I've been in all your chairs. So let's just go from there and we'll go to the stuff that you're interested in of what the content or the topic is. But the, the other people where most people start their presentations with, I was born this age and I did this. It's like, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah That's really? what you're there to talk about in the first place. I'm here to talk about SEO. You want to mm. talk about SEO? Let's talk about SEO. Right. I'm here to talk about Metasearch. You want to talk about Metasearch? Let's talk about Metasearch. You want to talk about my autobiography? You know, that's a conversation. Just take a beer. Just say it's going to take a beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was born a small child. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is funny how it, and, and people's perception of, of what we do as consulting and services is very biased upon what chair they sat in when they had people like us come in. Uh, you know, were they uh, on the defensive? Because a lot of times they were very contra to anything that was being presented, even if it was the same idea they were saying, because they were frustrated that they weren't being listened to. That was one thing. Yeah. And then the other was, were uh, did, did these consultancies or services come in and it was all about them, all about how cool we are, how great they are, because then you're subversive as to proving them wrong, going, hey, bosses on top of me that you made me work with these dork heads out of these companies. Look at this. They're not as good as they said they were. They did this and they didn't. You're dealing contra to the whole process. Uh, but if you can get them on your side, or at least real, for them to realize that they're an uh, that you're an asset to help them, truly, like then you're, you really have a great. That's when you get things done. That's when stuff happens that works out well because companies listen to you and their internal resources. For all the salespeople out there, that's referred to as having a champion. You have your yeah. champion. Right. Yes, an advocate of your cause, which exactly. you know, can go to a whole marketing thing, which is another lost aspect of all this from a marketing perspective is that I don't think any businesses right now are creating advocacies at all. It's because they're actually, they're fighting to maintain just service profiles that aren't negative in some ways. Is anybody that, I mean, is anybody you're seeing, I mean, I'm seeing great commercials, don't get me wrong, uh, and advertising campaigns from a variety of other industries. Um, Who's the guy that played the, the lead character in Deadpool? Um, Ryan Reynolds. Nah, was it? Was he? Was it Brad Deadpool? He, he was Deadpool. So yeah. Oh, okay, that's him. Okay. I don't know what's he's, he's doing. The advertising for uh, that gin and so forth. Yeah. Brilliant ads. Brilliant ads. Absolutely funny as heck. Interesting, engaging ads. And and you know, there's some great, amazing creativity out there. But I see a lot of our industry coming back, and it just pains me when I see this. I see Instagram posts that have static pictures of empty lobbies and porta cachets going, it's time to travel again, come visit us again. And we have great rates. And I'm sitting there going, 
that's on Instagram. It's about as tone deaf as you can possibly be on a platform that has no interest on in static pictures and pitches. I've been doing a lot of research on DE and I, and I did a some work on. Uh, I don't know if you've read who's Lauren Tuhill, the CEO, of, the CMO of Google. They've been doing a lot of like reflection about inclusive marketing. Um, so, okay, it might, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat. Might be worth looking at. But to that same thing, I, Marriott just did a new commercial. Um, dropped a lot of strong words in their you know experiences in there. I, if I took a shot every time they said experience, mm. I'd probably be drunk. But uh, I, that. <laughs> I just appreciate that it was a very inclusive, inclusive, inclusive marketing campaign. Um, that's a topic for another day, Lauren. Maybe we can yeah. do a show about. No, I'm I'm happy for that. Yeah. Results around that because now that I've done a lot of research for HSMAI, um, God, we have a lot of work to do. Oh, we have. The- Oh, I say, what, one of the advertisements that I've been seeing, and I'm in Nebraska, for those that don't know, uh, but our Omaha Epley Airfield has been doing commercials and advertisements of return to Omaha Epley Airfield. And I just, I don't quite, I, it's a nice commercial, but I don't quite get it because either I need to fly or I don't. I'm not just going to go to the airfield to hang out one day. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, sort of and there's really no other airfields around, by the way. So where else am I going to go? <laughs> yeah, it okay. Just so that we can entice the topic in the future, inclusive advertising and inclusive marketing and inclusive operations is a is a critical issue that we are not dealing with. I mean, in so many freaking ways, it's mind numbing actually as to how ignorant uh, our industry is to this opportunity and what their responsibility is. And it's not even a opportunity to be based on just revenue potential. It's just sheer ignorance to cultural and diversification and awareness of everybody that needs our services. And, and it is, it is amazing the limitations we have. And even now, especially going back into mainstream demand that we are having for so many different markets, all those um, legalities of compliance and so forth, just in that spectrum are just inflating all over again where they're being pursued again. Okay, you're back into business and you haven't done anything about your ADA compliances. You haven't done anything about your special need travelers compliances. You haven't done anything about those things. And 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 pandering to segmentations that are ethnically non-diverse, I'm trying to be as politically right as I can about this, you know, is, is sad. I mean, honestly, it's sad. You, this is the chance to really augment your diversification of what it is that you uh, uh, are offering. And you're instead going to the least common denominator in most of what's being done. It's it's yeah, I I completely agree with you in that sense to it. It it's like they're dusting off the old stuff and putting it back into play. They're just they're not really taking advantage of the change in spectrum of what our society is right now and, and all the things that it could represent. So yeah, totally, totally with you on that sense. I did want to have another question before we kind of wrap on other things, I guess. And that is, are you getting any security questions? Are people asking you about services and or security protocols? I mean, brand is brand. Brand has a security. They t- defer to its functionalities in general. But the and they've pro- already made a lot of poor decisions around security already, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have not. I mean, other than my my business insurance is really trying to sell me a, a separate cyber security package. And I tell them, like, because... You know, because we're not a booking engine, because of like we're not we're not in a place where we're collecting any guest data that could be, um, you know, like I wish I had the guest data from, but you know we're not we're not getting that guest data. Yeah, I, yeah this came up in previous live shows for me, but I talked about it on Clubhouse as well too. I have always kept uh, cybersecurity insurance over the years for a variety of reasons. One is we have confidential access to clients and so forth, uh, their their accounts, and their and and so forth, and and a lot of the data that we share back and forth reporting and, and things like this, I have them on encrypted servers and all, but from an insurance perspective, uh, and I just had this adventure, Dean, you've heard me talk about this, where um, my, my annual renewal was uh, almost a third more this year. And I'm like, wait, okay. So we started going in and starting looking at what we do is comparative. And we found other companies and that they would look more affordable. I'm like, oh, this is great. Until we get into the nitty gritty of, proposing what we were asking for coverage. Oh, no, we can't know. Then, and the price goes up to what we're already having. 
turned out there was a lot of things that we said we did as services that were interpreted completely different by the insurance companies. Like uh, when I referred to due diligence. Okay. Well, the insurance company read that, oh, you have control and access to assets. <laughs> no, 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 no. Due diligence, what you're thinking is not the due diligence that we're doing, you know, and breaking those things down, but also just from what's been happening, um, the hacks that have been happening uh, with companies, the first thing that these companies, it, it, for, I saw it in the news recently, it, the, the cybersecurity business is a $48 billion insurance business right now for 2021 just in, in the premium costs that are going on. It's astronomical, the cost to it. And what these insurance companies do because of the legalities to it, they pursue who had access to this account. And just by the merit that having access to the account puts you into the fray of what are you doing protocol wise? And the other thing I noticed with my insurance when I was going through and looking for alternatives, it used to be checkbox stuff. Do you have a protocol for handling passwords? Yes. That's all you asked for a year ago. Now it's like, great. When was it last tested? What platform do you use? And what's the result of the testing? Please provide an attachment. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh, so it's just not saying yes. It's like, yes, and, and I got to show all this stuff. And so it's really become more and more refined as to the insurance requirements with it. And a lot of these companies, I mean, I started asking this question of the clients we have with, a lot of them don't have security. Uh, insurance and or security protocols and or SOP for it or anything like that. They 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 get they get hacked and they get into a ransomware situation or any sort of malware attack, whatever. They're just screwed in a lot of ways. And I was just very surprised by that. And finding out some things from brand relationship, if it's not from if it, the source of the intrusion is not from brand, brand has no hands on this. It's it's at the liability of the management company and or the ownership and or whatever entities are engaged. And brand is like, not my thing. Not me. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just kind of curious if you're getting answers and questions. like Because there's some pretty cool platforms out there. Um, now as soon as I say them, I can't remember the name. But they they test, they filch test. Uh, you get into their SMP and uh, SDMP program protocol for your the company you're dealing with. And they send out testing. They first off do training. Hey guys, avoid these emails. Hey guys, avoid these SMS messaging. This is the things to look for, so forth. And then they go out and test everybody to see did they learn from the, the training? And they track down who didn't. Like, uh, I'm sorry, Dean, you opened that email that we told you not to open. And unfortunately, it was just a test of ours, but this is what could have happened. So they try to also do the repetitive testing protocoling afterwards. So, but it was funny because, of course, it came up on AppSumo first. I'm like, oh, this is great quickly came down because they sold out. Then they offered the year only. Now they offered out that they have no availability of scale right now. You can't get this product because they just don't have, the demand was so massive. They don't have the ability to scale up to the demand right now. I was like, wow, impressively scary that their demand is so high, but it's like, but there are other tools out there. They're just more expensive to do that kind of stuff. It's just curious. All right, wait a minute. What's the HGS mass stuff you threw in? Do I have, oh, diversity, cool, cool, cool. I'll put that in the notes. Um, Steph, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you. I was wondering. I'm sorry, I'm in so MIA. I mean, it's a. No, I mean, you, you, I figured you're just busy as heck, which is a great thing in that sense. You know, um, and oh, oh, I need actually, since I got you, I need to ask you. So I wasn't joking about the possibility of Marriott having watched us or whatever today, but uh, we're trying to fulfill the content aspects of the TV channel. I don't know whether I shared with you or maybe I did. We're now on Roku and Google TV and, and Amazon Fire Sticks and we're app on Apple and Google and everything else. We're on all the platforms. It's, we're like a channel out, like Netflix is on Roku and stuff. You just can sign up for hospitality channel. The show goes live for free on the open side of it, but we're putting the content and, and the inf of stuff for, for the people that pay to subscribe. So if there's anything you want to put on this channel, you are more than one because we have two channels, basically. We have that and then we have hospitality channel that TV, which is a linear TV programming that we put the live show replays on and the archives, uh, the podcasts on, uh, on all that kind of stuff as well with the video component to it. So if there's stuff you want to put on there or just, hey, this episode of the show is brought to you by Cogwheel Marketing, throw me a video snip if you want and I'll throw it in there as just a dialogue on it because it's a 24 seven, it's the only, and I mean this sincerely, I looked everywhere possible, the only 24 seven hospitality TV channel right now. Would you take content that I've already recorded? Yeah, of course. 
we so just started doing we just started doing these collaboration calls for like getting other people that do digital marketing for brands and just mm -hmm. kind of discussing and i'm more just the facilitator of you know bring your problems to the table see if you know so, see if somebody can solve them and i started recording those and there we um it's um you know i've been outside the management company realm for a while and i forget the i, I, I sometimes get a little bit far removed from some of the issues that they have so it's been yeah. um but it was recorded i think it turned out pretty good um it's not solicitational at all it's um quite educational but, but no and and um but to be with you it's like solicitation is fine honestly like i said you we make you mock sponsor of anything you want to be because right now sunday through monday i plan a there's like a tv channel what plays at what time for stuff 24 7. How now have fortunately we have seven years of the freaking live show well, and 14 years of podcast so <laughs> you know I, we can actually bore somebody for a month and a half not repeating content and i mean that sincerely we have that much content <laughs> you know but the other podcasts and so forth so i've been now beginning to create little video things that are kind of fun like you're watching the hospitality channel and it's nice little logo transitions and stuff just for brand identification I have one of those that i never uh, used I have one of those little video intros that I've never used. Yeah, um, so put it in, and and if you have anything, and if you want me to, I can make stuff where it's like you know brought to you by Caldwell Market. And if there's a pitch video that you have about what you do, if you have something like that, I'll put it in one because the hospitalitychannel.tv is always constantly running. It's got three fat, well two right that are running. One is the linear programming, which is Sunday through Monday. Okay, and I constantly update. It. Like this show will get put into the sequence, and then there's the on-demand version of it, which is. I want to look up and I'm starting to categorize what the demands are. Like I want to look at all the co-hosts from 2016, 2017, 2018. I can see all the co-hosts and I can play different shows like Netflix. Like I want to watch this show. On the Roku, Google, Amazon, uh, Apple TV portion, which is a subscription one, that content is, is more relevant to training, learning, and value because we're asking $4.90 per month for people to subscribe to it because everybody has a, it's a cost to it. Um, we have a free side, which the live show runs on, but the paid side is the more relevant content. So if you have something that you think would best promote what you're doing content wise, like something like you just said on there, then we could throw it on and it's an on demand thing. They go in there, they subscribe, they pick what they want to watch. And that's kind of where the Marriott conversation is coming because we're talking about restaurant or food and beverage, having a, uh, what's called a story list, a story line that. Uh, they have their content on. So if you want to watch this show, there's all these episodes in that show and that playlist that you can watch. So it's pretty cool. I mean, well, as I weird as it sounds, I'm like totally stoked that we have the only hospitality TV channel. And it's not, it, 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 it's kind of like a great point. Not that it's not a food channel or a travel channel. It's, it's for the industry. So. Well, I should introduce you. There's, you know, who put out some great video content as revenue hub. They put out, I don't know if you ever watched their stuff, but they do a really good job with their, video editing and things like that and i also know at marriott that who's like the director of education for the marketing department so they have a podcast mds's podcast but they put out some really good content um that might be yeah. worth i mean it, it, right now it's a matter of getting uh you know it's cart before the horse stuff it's like in order to get great content we need an audience to verify the content but also mm -hmm. the same token to get an audience need good content so for me right now at the stage of the process is everything's running it took me months to get this thing. I mean, it was amazing the granularity that all these platforms require to authenticate your ability. Because right now, if you go on your Apple phone or pad or tablet, we're an app. A hospitality channel is an app. You know, if you go to Apple TV, it's a channel you can get on Apple TV. You know, if you go to Roku, same thing. If you go to Google, same thing. If you go to Amazon uh, Prime and also on Firestick, we're a channel. You know, just like if you're downloading the access to Netflix or any of these other ones. Um, the neat part of it is, is it's at the nascent level. It's like, we just now are here. The content's gonna dictate the interest. You know, what do we do? And, and all these aspects are gonna be, if we get more content that people are interested in watching, they're more likely to say, yeah, it's worth me paying five bucks a month to see, or buy for a quarter and get 15% off, or half a year, get 20% off or whatever, and get an audience. And now we have an audience that's watching our TV channel. Now the other people we can go to for content go and say, hey, look, we have this audience that likes this stuff. We want your stuff on there for them to see. So does that mean that other community platform you were building um, went? Nope, it's still there. The club is still there. Um, we're building the club as a part of the value of the club is that they get to have the channel as a part of the membership. But the club price has changed a lot because I realized 
rather than trying to do it as a monthly that was a price point for companies, like 250 a month wasn't a big deal. Now it's 49 bucks. It's like, look, you go on and off, in and out, depending upon what you want to learn. The deal of it is, though, is that the more you stay with us, the more libraries available. When you cut, you jump in and out, you're only available to the library that you're currently subscribed to. But if you stay subscribed, all of the historical library stays. So that, but the, the TV channel is just a value proposition to the people that join the club. So it's a mix. I'm trying to go over and change the mix. Anyways, uh, so anything you want to just, we can talk side of our, whatever you want to put on, anybody you want to connect to that thinks it has good content, we can all talk about it and get that on there too as well. So, okay, with that in mind, keeping this at a two-hour happy point, Mr. Dean, where can people find you and where can they listen to you and all this other cool stuff? Metasearchmarketing.com or basecampmeta.com. You can also tune into the Heavy Meta podcast. Uh, also recently working with HSMAI now as part of their educational content, you'll find a section that talks about Metasearch and getting your game up on Metasearch. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, working on some new content, which you know about. Uh, a couple of things we've actually alluded to today, one of them being the Google's uh, bid levers for date sensitive uh, bidding, right? So I want to be more or less aggressive. And I'm also going to be doing a, I did a TripAdvisor Plus video uh, back in March when they first rolled that out. The pros and cons of TripAdvisor Plus you can find on YouTube. And it, a lot of things have changed since then. So I'm going to be doing a three months later version of that. Uh, mm. Some things they fixed, some things they didn't fix, some problems that have arisen because of some fixes and so on. And we'll cool. take a closer look at that. So a lot of exciting things going on. Cool. Hey, Steph, if you have anybody, by the way, sales-wise, I'm looking for a, a, additional host for the sales podcast. I want to diversify up the hosting that we have for the sales podcast. Guest host, if they want to take over an episode of the sales uh, podcast for whatever they're talented with, by all means, Dean, you already know, but I mean, just, you know, if you have anybody in mind that, that would like to host a pod without the obligation of being stuck all the time, but just have an episode that they want to talk about what they feel is valuable, by all means, let me know. But for everybody that wants to know about you and Cogwell Marketing and all the amazing stuff you do, where can they find you? I have somebody that I'm thinking um, very, that I would highly recommend. But with that said, Stephanie Sparksmith on LinkedIn, cogwellmarketing.com. And then my um, my plug being that I am currently in development of creating a cross-brand platform, cross-brand reporting platform that pulls information from all the major brands with web data and then incorporates um, the paid data, Expedia, Cody, da da da, into one, one place. Pulls wow. the information. So um, it took me a while to find a developer that had, that could do what I wanted to, but you can basically pull data, you know, monthly, weekly, daily, if you wanted to, um, into this dashboard. And if you, you know, Lauren, how, how lovely it is to work with pulling down some of those reports, but I've figured out a way to. Wow. Congratulations. That's, geez, that's like holy grail conversation. Like, man, you do that, right? <laughs> man. Oh, I, that definitely. Yeah. Yeah. As you're getting closer to it or when it finally rolls out, totally got to focus on getting, you know, we do a show where it's just like, tell us what this does and yeah. how it does and yeah. stuff. Cause I'm looking for um, a proof of concept, somebody to be my guinea pig because I've done most of the development work, but until you, I feel like each management company has their own KPIs they look for and, you know, the visualization of that data can be customizable. So I need somebody that will give me all their stuff now that I've kind of built it out and said, okay, this is how we, this is what we want to see and how we like to see it. How many different brands do you want to try to put together? Right now I have um, Marriott Hilton ISG. Okay. I might have a candidate for you and I'll definitely introduce you to them in the sense of whether or not they would be, I think they'd be more than willing to think they're very keen in on aggregation of information and consolidation of They're trying to also grow as a management company from what they've historically been doing. They want to take this as an opportunity to grow. So having this capability as a calling card for their future dialogues. Well, the next thing about this is my partner in this already has an ops dashboard. So they already pull PMS data. They already pull, star data they can integrate with any accounting software so if you think about just there's the data piece of it then there's like going a step further and like comparing budget and forecast spin versus actual like we can we have that functionally built out because of the other operational components i mean you can obviously buy the marketing free standalone but when you talk about total integration of um 
you know, of data points, it, it takes mm -hmm. it further as well. So. Wow. Okay. Yes. We do have to have many more conversations about that. Cool. Um, for uh, everyone to understand, we have migrated the show over permanently now to hospitalitychannel.tv. We will keep it going at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live just as a perennial transfer over of, of archive data. But our main focus is that you can watch this and all previous episodes at hospitalitychannel.tv. Um, that plays 24-7, uh, straight up channel. We'll be adding more pages to it, which will have a different diversity of content choices. Uh, we're also available for those that we talked about on Roku, Apple, uh, Google, Amazon. And if you want to see that in, in a website form, the vanity site that that's located is talktravel.tv. Uh, there you can see what it looks like uh, on all the other platforms. If you don't want to go on those platforms to do it, it is an app, so you can get it on your Apple and Google and all the rest of the platforms. With that in mind, um, if you'd like to see the uh, previous episodes, including this one, and if you need, need to translate, we translate it in 11 languages. You can watch it on YouTube on, with the closed captioning on the other alternative languages. Um, we also recast this uh, at a more equitable time for some of our time zones, APAC and in EU. We do it at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Wednesday, corresponding to the time zones for Sydney and London. Uh, so that goes back out onto uh, those platforms as well. And uh, we are on, um, of, as we always have been on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, uh, YouTube, but also we are now also on uh, Xbox and PlayStation through Twitch. So we're multicasting on those as well. And also, as I said before, the four large TV platforms. So we're like, can't hide from us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and if you have any questions or comments uh, about the show and or feedbacks and or content that you'd like to be or like to be a guest host on this, you can reach out to me at lauren at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com. I answer each and every email regardless of the channel from it. So please contact me. With that, Steph, it was great seeing you again. I'm totally fascinated with what you're building and I'm totally stoked about whether or not I can participate in that as a guinea pig in future tense uh and and all that cool stuff and any content you want to share and any ideas for sales podcast people and so forth dean i will probably talk to you a dozen times next week anyway so uh <laughs> <laughs> with that in mind thank you everybody for having joined us today everybody in the audiences different channels we'll see everyone next week 11 30 a.m and you can also join us in clubhouse noon monday through thursday and also 8 a.m. Edward St. Ange runs a room for hospitality marketing on Clubhouse as well. 8 a.m. Monday through Friday. So you got us everywhere. All right. I will talk to you all another time. Bye, guys. Okay. See you. Bye.